Hi, sir. I cannot hear you, sir. So you're mute. I think so, yes. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good, because then it'll be a problem if you can't hear me and I keep speaking. Huh? <laughs> okay, guys, we start with this grace. Welcome to another session of Chai Coffee and Industry about a topic which is very, very uh, close to my heart because it's very challenging. Okay, I find it here composites more challenging than a composite because that's something that people see is an emotional aspect of aesthetic dentistry. You can touch the emotions of the patient. You're working on the front teeth, teeth that are going to be shown in public. So you want to make sure that you do good work. All right. So this is more of an art form. You're going to be assuming the role of an artist when you talk about anterior art um, uh, dentistry, be it composites, be it ceramic, be it anything that, it, that, that relates to aesthetics, okay? So you are gonna be working as an artist. You are gonna be assuming the role of an artist because anterior dentistry requires lots and lots of art, all right? Now, why composites? Why composites? Why direct composites? Mostly for me, all right? Now, there are certain cases where I choose to do indirects as well, but there are Lots and lots of reasons why I love doing direct composites. And the two main reasons would stand out, but there are other reasons as well. The main, for me, the first main reason is minimally invasive because anterior composites is additive dentistry. So you've lost a tooth structure because of fracture, trauma, caries, wear, whatever, all right? You add to what is lost. You're not taking, taking anything more away from the tooth structure, all right? It's minimally invasive and I would even go on to the extent that there are certain cases, it is even non-invasive. I'm gonna show you cases where we did not touch the tooth with the burr or disc or anything and we just added what was lost to the tooth structure and the results were phenomenal, all right? So it's, it's, it's a truly non-invasive or minimal invasive industry. You are the master of the technique. You are not dependent on technicians uh, for the final work. Most of the times, I'm mean, sure all of you have gone through this. You, you do a beautiful prep, you take amazing impression, or you scan your, or your preps and you send it to the lab and the lab just ruins everything. There's no shape, there's no form, the line angles are not defined, the bridges are not defined. There are no textures, there's no opalescence, there is no lifelike translucency in the work that you get from the lab. And then you start to, <clears throat> you know, get restless. So, now in, in this, you are the master. You are the one who's planning. You are the one who's executing. So you do exactly know what you want. The entire picture of what you want is already in your head. And then you just have to realize and get that picture and work with your hands to realize what you have in your head. So you are controlling. The result is controlled right from the start till the end by you and, none, and, and, and not by any third party. So because you are the master of the technique, the results are more predictable. Everything can be done in a single visit. Everything can be done in a single visit. And that's what I like about anterior composites. You can do everything in a single visit, right? <clears throat> Patient comes to you with trauma, with a fracture, with decay. You remove the decay, you take care of the trauma, you put some composite there, and the patient walks out of the clinic in one, two hours with the intact tooth, doing a lot of good to the confidence of the patient. All right. It's less expensive, obviously, than the indirect composites in the indirect ceramics. Aesthetics, I will show you, is at par with ceramics. The only aspect of aesthetics that you might, is, is a drawback, I would say, is because it does not last as long as ceramics. So you get good aesthetics, but you need to do some touch-ups time and again to get the polish, to retain the polish, because after all, it is resin. It is plastic material. It is going to wear down with time. It is going to wear down with your brushing. It is going to wear down with mastication, with the functional loading that you put on it. So obviously the sheen, the shine, the size is not going to be as long lasting as ceramics, but then it's, does not, it's not all that bad. If you polish it properly and you reach out, touch it after every nine months or a year, 
it still works and, and, and gives you results and, and works for the patient for a long, long, long time. It's long lasting, okay? So a lot of people now tell me it's a class four, you've done a beautiful class four edge buildup. How long will it last? No, it all depends on your diagnosis and treatment planning. If a patient has edge to edge bite and you built an edge, how long will it last? Obviously it's not gonna last any longer, right? You did not take care of the incisal guidance of the patient. Patient has a deep bite and you did a class four buildup. And, patient, and you did not take care of that bite, obviously how long will it last? It's not gonna be long lasting. It all depends on your diagnosis and treatment planning. It all depends on your knowledge of functional occlusion, static occlusion, dynamic occlusion. Once you get all those, so, so everything that you place, every restriction that you place in the tooth has to conform to the occlusion norms. If it does not conform to the occlusion norms, it is not going to last long. It is going to be good, it's going to look good, at, Remember, we, we talked about the perceived quality and the hidden quality of the restoration. Obviously, when you do that restoration and the patient is happy, that's the perceived quality, but how long will it last is the hidden quality. That depends on so many factors. That depends on your factors, such as how did you prepare that? What was the etching and bonding protocol? Did you take care of the occlusion? Did you check the incisal guidance? Did you check the canine guidance? All that aspect. Well, whether the patient has deep bite, open bite, all those things. So it is a long lasting restoration provided you put everything into picture, okay? One of the best and the greatest advantages of composites is you can easily repair it. You get a patient with a chipped composite, rest of the restoration looks absolutely fine. You don't want to touch in the integrity of the restoration is, is, is pristine. You just want to do some edge buildup you could just want to correct that and it's easy to repair. You can do this without damage. Less cost to the patients and that's what you want. And like I said, uh, the second most important reason for me why I love doing direct composite, it's very satisfying. When you are able to execute the result right from the beginning till the end and you get what you want as a final result, you are happy and that happiness is very important. The end or result of your any procedure in this history has to be happiness. Because if it is, if that procedure gives you happiness, then you're gonna be always be looking forward to do good dentistry in the time to come. If you're not happy with your work, then you get frustrated, you lose interest, and that's when you start to go down the abyss. Okay. So happiness is very important. So patient comes to you like this, all right, and then you do not touch the tooth structure and the patient leaves your clinic in one and a half hours like this. This is non-invasive dentistry. We did not prepare the tooth. We did not touch the tooth structure. We did not do anything. We just added what was lost. And this is truly additive, non-invasive dentistry. Patient after orthodontic treatment, we left the space for the peg lateral to build up in the end. And this is how the patient left the clinic after one hour. Now, if I tell you this is a Emax ceramic veneer, you would agree. If I don't tell you this is a composite, you probably think, yeah, yeah, this doesn't look like, this is a direct composite restoration, all right? Working absolutely fine. And I have a follow-up of at least four to six years for this case, okay? It's very satisfying. It, this is why I love doing direct composites. Peg laterals, truly additive dentistry, non-invasive. You replace what is lost and that's it. And that's what is, gives you so much of happiness and satisfaction. Patient, a dentist comes to you like this, wants an immediate result, quick result. For so many reasons, I'm probably gonna discuss this case with you. I add some composite there, distribute the space, reshape the teeth, and that's what you get in the end. And because all these procedures are so satisfying for me. Now, this is also a direct composite restoration, but then done by somebody else. Right, so a composite can be a very satisfying or it could be a very unsatisfying experience for you, right? So this is unsatisfying, but then you can make it satisfying like that, isn't it? So just remove and then add what is lost and then you can guess. So you just don't have to just work with your hands. You have to have knowledge. You have to use your head. You have to use your head and you have to work with your heart, with your passion. And you have to translate all that knowledge and passion that you have into skills, okay? So it's a combination of head, heart, and hands, okay? It's more of passion and skill. 
And of course, we're all getting digitized, right? Now. We all are moving towards a digital age, digital enhanced dentistry. But remember, you still need your hands, okay? You still need your hands. You still have to work with your hands and enhance that art form. Now, again, those three principles is aligned last, as I showed you last time, everything in dentistry has to be doable, it has to be predictable, and has to be repeatable. And that is a measure of success of anything that you do in dentistry. It has to be doable, it has to be predictable, so that not just me, everybody can do it. And you need to get repeatable results for it to be counted as success. And you cannot count, do all these things unless, unless you simplify things. So don't try to make things complex, try to simplify them. And I'm gonna give you some simplified protocols towards achieving high quality aesthetic results with your direct composite restorations, all right? So what is it that you need to know? What do you, what do you want to know to get to those results? The first and the foremost thing is that you need to know about the tooth structure. When it comes to direct composite restoration, the first and the foremost knowledge that you need to acquire is that you need to start looking at a tooth not only just in terms of shape or structure, but also in terms of optical properties. What gives color to the tooth? Why does tooth have so many colors? What is the characteristic of the incisal edge? Some people have mammula, some don't. Opalescence, secondary textures, tissue textures, line angles, embrasures, all those anatomical features. So you need to upgrade your knowledge about tooth structure. You need to uh, take courses on, on enhancing your knowledge about the structure. And one of the courses that I can recommend is a course by Hanus Mako. He's an Hungarian uh, technician, just does phenomenal morphological work and takes a seven days course on posterior and interior uh, anatomy. So it just so just go and, and, and find that person probably next year, hopefully he should be here in India. And if he is here in India, don't miss out the opportunity. You need to know what gives color to the tooth. What is the characteristic of a tooth? Why is the incisal edge of a tooth opaque? Just like it has the same color as dentine. What is this bluish thing that you have in between? What are those horizontal bands of horizontal lines that are there on the tooth? Why are they there? What is the secondary anatomy? What are the source secondary grooves and textures that are there? You need to understand all these things. Why does some opalescence look blue, some amber? Why is incisal edge sometimes more whitish and opaque and sometimes more amberish? Why is it like that? All those characteristics have you have, if you don't look at those characteristics, how are you going to replicate it in a tooth? Now, if this tooth has, one of these tooth has a class four fracture and you do not see the final nuances, what is the design of the mammalons? What is the design of the opalescence in the adjacent tooth? How will you replicate it? If you just do a monochromatic restoration of that tooth, it is not going to match. Even if you get the shape right, it still is not going to match till you stratify it properly. So a lot of people will tell you this is more like a doctors do in dentistry, all this layering and all layering is all dead. You just have to injection mold everything and that's it. I do not agree with that. I believe you must endeavor to replicate nature or to, of course, it's very difficult to do that, but at least endeavor to reach close to it. That is, that is what it is. You're not just a technician, you are a artist, you are a dentist. And it is your duty to upgrade your skills and knowledge and try to get closer to the nature as possible. Okay, so you need to understand. I'm going to show you where a monochromatic restoration would be much more beneficial than layering. But there are certain aspects where layering would definitely be proved to be a greater advantage than a monochromatic single shade restoration. If you're not able to see all those bluish opalescence, you know, those hyperplastic white spots on the teeth, how are you going to replicate that? So what do you need to do? How do you, how will you come to know about the tooth structure? What is required to know about the tooth structure? You need to have in-depth knowledge about photography if you really want to do good composite restoration or for that matter, good aesthetic dentistry requires the, the, the primary requirement, okay? It's, a, it's not a choice. It's not a choice. The primary requirement for you 
for doing good aesthetic interest-based photography. You need to upgrade yourself into learning photography because you're able to see all those effects, you'll be able to replicate it, all right? Dental photography is the most important aspects. There are so many wide ways you can achieve and get good quality, beautiful pictures, and you need to learn to do that, okay? Look at this picture. This picture is taken by a friend of mine, Tushar Burani, a wonderful photographer, amazing wildlife photographer. And look at how, of course, it has this picture, but look at the beautiful structure of a tooth. If you are able to see all that stuff, you'll be, you'll have, or you'll at least do and make an endeavor to replicate it. But if you're not able to see all this, you will never be able to replicate it. All right. So for example, here, two one is a restoration. It's a class four fracture buildup and you need to replicate to, and you can see those horizontal lines. You can see the incisal halo. You can see the opalescence and the incisal one third that I've tried to replicate and try to match it with the adjacent tooth structure. Uh, that is all possible if you are able to see all that stuff. What is the other thing that you require? Of course, we cannot achieve all these things if we don't have good materials to work with. Now we have, so the, the dental sciences have advanced to such a great extent that you have amazing materials. So dental companies have advanced significantly over the past decade or two. And you can see that initially what we had, the kind of materials that we have, the optical properties were not really great. Uh, we had macro hybrid or macro field, which were good in strength, but, but very poor aesthetic qualities. Then came the micro field, which had great aesthetic quality, but had lagged strength. So now we have materials such as nano hybrids or nano composites or microhybrid composites, which not only have good strength, but also have good polishability. They have good aesthetic feel. And polishability, not just which lasts for only a small period of time, but something that lasts you for a very, very long time. So ability to retain the polish is enhanced with these materials. So with the newer materials that we have, enhanced optical properties and aesthetics can be realized with a direct composite. You can create all those effects that you see in nature, or at least come close to it, okay, to be undetectable by the human eye. Look at all the fissures that I've recreated within, this is a composite uh, buildup. So I can, I've simulated the crack lines and I've simulated the hyperplastic spots. I've simulated a dark fissure. You can see the horizontal lines of Regis, all that stuff. Shalu Ishita Agarwal. Yeah, so Please don't. I'm connecting with my laptop now. Please don't go in and out of the meeting. It disturbs everybody. All right. So. See, you can all achieve all those effects. You can achieve all those bluish translucency and sazal halo that you see. You can get all those effects just by practicing. So you need to practice with the material. You need to see what material has what kind of optical properties in the end, at, at the end of the day. So what if I build the, the, the palatal shell with a more translucent material? What if, if I build the palatal shell with a material which is very, very, very transparent or opaque? What, what is the effect going to happen? How is it going to look? How is it going to affect the optical properties of the end result that I want? All these things cannot be realized by working on the patient. All these things cannot be realized by experimenting on the patient. When you get a material in your hand, you need to start simulating the work on your type of models. If you don't simulate, you will never understand the properties of the material. Once you do that, you understand, okay, this, this is how this material looks like in the end when you finish and polish. And then in the end, when the patient comes to you, you've already worked on the material, you already know how it's gonna look. So that's how in the lateral incisor, if you see, I have tried to mimic the incisal halo without putting any opaque material at the incisal edge. I have not put any opaque material in the incisal edge. Still, I get that kind of opaque incisal halo. Why does it happen? So this is how you understand. This is how you will understand the optical properties of the material. Okay. Last but not the least, you need to know about the techniques. What are the various techniques to realize the end result? Okay, should I do injection molding? Should I use bioclear matrices? Should I use sectional matrices? Do I need to use the palatal keys? Should I use a mala strip? So many different ways to reach the end. But what works in your hand 
depends and what you choose is one that is more predictable in your hand something that you can achieve consistent results with right so you have to find your own recipe your own technique which gives you consistent result i'm going to show you various techniques and then you see what works in your hand and then you start to develop that technique more efficiently now when it comes to aesthetics <laughs> I didn't think that was funny. Was that funny? Is my lecture funny so far? Please mute yourselves. So, so first, the first and the foremost important thing that you need to learn about anterior aesthetics, about anterior teeth is the shape, the proportion, the shape, all that stuff need, you need to understand. You need to understand the line angles. Where would you define the line angles? What is the proportion of the, what is the incisor and embrasure look like as you go from anterior to, 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 as you go from incisor to canines? What is the virtual width? What is a actual width? How can you have illusions of narrowing the teeth or widening the teeth? All these things. So a knowledge about shape of the teeth is so important, not only when you're doing direct composites, also when you're doing indirect ceramics, veneers, when you want to communicate with your lab and tell them, this is what I want. Don't let lab choose the shape that he wants, okay? Lab technician does not know what he wants. You know what you want. You need to tell the lab technician what is the kind of shape. Are you looking at oval shape, like triangular shape, triangular shape, I mean sizes, what are you looking at? Do you want some disparity in the size of the laterals? Do you want some lateral to be likely more rotated than the other? All those things. The shape is something that you need to focus on. Even if you get a shape shade wrong slightly, instead of A2, you got D2. And so A2, you got slightly, let's say, 2.5, A3. But if you get the shape right, the shade will not, the patient is not going to mind the shape so much. But if you get the shape wrong and the shade is matching, the patient is going to be worried. He's going to say the two centers do not look the same. Right? So you need to understand that. You need to understand the teeth are not, they're not smooth structures. They have texture. Now, when it, and then this texture will obviously start fading away as you get old, as you, the patient, as the process of wear, erosion, abrasion, all these things take over. Over a period of time, your enamel is going to, the label stuff is going to become more, much more smoother and much more translucent. All right. But you need to understand the texture because if one of the tooth, adjacent tooth has a texture and you give a, and you give a restoration which does not have a texture, which simulates the adjacent tooth texture, the light reflection is not going to be the same. Those two teeth, even though they have a right shape, will still not look very good. Okay, something is always going to be a mess when you look at it. Last but not the least, we need to we need to worry about the color. All right, I know a lot of people when it comes to interior aesthetics have a lot of problem with shade matching and shade selection. I think that should be the last of your concerns. The first and the foremost thing that you need to upgrade yourself is on anatomy of teeth, on shape, on texture, and then finally the color. Okay, so let's understand tooth color. What gives color to the tooth? Because until, unless we understand what gives color to the tooth, we cannot understand what are the composite shades we need to be using to get that color. Now, when it comes to the color of a tooth, if you look at the dentine, the dentine is what is responsible for the final chroma. So the base chroma or the color of a tooth is defined by dentine. What does it mean? It means that the final color of your restoration or final shade of your restoration is defined by dentine shade. It is going to be modified a bit by the enamel shade that you place on the top. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But the base color of your restoration is given by dentine shade as a base color of a tooth natural tooth is defined by dentine. Similarly, the final color of your restoration is defined by dentine. Now, when it comes to dentine shade, you will see that the color of the chroma of the dentine does not stay uniform throughout the body of the dentine. You will see that the dentine is more darker near the pulp. And as you go towards the label surface, the chroma reduces. Similarly, the dentine is more chromatic in, in the cervical one third. And as you come towards the incisal one third, the chroma reduces, it becomes less saturated. Now this is called as desaturation phenomena of dentine. 
which means that as you go from cervical to incisal, there is a decrease in the chroma. As you grow from palatal to the facial, there is a decrease in the chroma. And you need to sort of simulate this dechromatization phenomena in order for that tooth to look natural. Now, so as I said, <clears throat> chroma and value have inverse relationship. Value is the degree of brightness or whiteness of a color, how white that tooth is. Greater the whiteness of the color, greater the value of a tooth. Lesser the darker the tooth, lesser the value of a tooth. So basically dentine defines the chroma and enamel shade defines the value. How whiter the tooth should look, how darker the tooth should look is defined by our enamel. Whereas dentine is the one which defines the saturation or the chroma of the tooth. Now, the color of the dentine does not stay uniform throughout. Sorry. The color of the dentine does not stay uniform throughout. It changes with age. It changes with time. If you look at the young tooth, which is, <clears throat> is an eight-year-old child, look at how opaque the tooth is. It's not reflecting a lot of light. It looks very opaque. So when a tooth has a higher value, it looks more opaque. Anything that does not allow the light to transmit properly and only sort of reflects all the light gives you opaque appearance. And anything which is more opaque in natural teeth will look more whiter. That is why your, because the young teeth of a child have not mineralized enough, does not have enough hydroxyapatite crystals yet developed. Therefore, it does not allow the light to transmit nicely because it does not allow the trans light to transmit nicely. Therefore, it looks more opaque. Also, the dentine has not developed to such an extent that it starts to shine through that opaque enamel and therefore the tooth looks more opaque in a child. But as you see at the bottom figure, this is a tooth of a 58 year old female. Look at how the light is beautifully reflecting. It is along the light. So the dentine has become more saturated with chroma. It has become more, um, it has acquired more minerals because it becomes more sclerotic with age. As it becomes more sclerotic, it allows the light to transmit more efficiently. Also with age, the enamel starts to wear down. So the dentine starts to show more. And you will see that with age, the translucency of the dentine will increase because it becomes more sclerotic and the opacity is going to decrease. So why is it important for us to understand this? It's important because when you are trying to restore a tooth of an eight-year-old child, you will use less chromatic shades. You will, look more, you will look to use more opaque shades, shades which have higher value. Similarly, when you're trying to, to simulate or repair a tooth of 50 or 60 or person, you will choose shades which are more translucent, which are slightly more chromatic and which have less value or which are less opaque. Understand? So that's how, why it's important to understand the color and the gradation it change and things that happen with change, with age. So most important parameter in shade selection is the determination of correct saturation and chroma, which means the selection of the dentine shade. So 80% of the teeth will have, this is a study which was done by Jody Manuta and Ante, uh, Angelo Prignano and Walter DeVoto, all those people, Louis Harden of the, of the Style Italiano group. They did this study and they found out that 80% of the teeth of a generalized population would have air, have hue in the A range, which means that you do not need to keep composites of B, C or D, or all those hues. If you have a composite just of an A hue, you can solve 80 to 85% of all your dental aesthetic needs, especially when it comes to direct composites. Now, when you look at the average hue of the interiors, the wavelength of this falls in the range of A2, A3 and A3.5, which means that <clears throat> if you have A2, a3 and A3.5 is dentine shades, you can solve 80 to 85% of all your dental needs, especially anterior dental needs. So in your armamentarium, you should at least have A2 dentine, A3 dentine, A3.5 dentine, and also body shades A2 and A3. So if you have A2, A3 as body shades, and you have these three shades of dentine, I think you are 100% sorted for all the needs in terms of anterior composite aesthetics. 
okay how would you generate color vitality remember we talked about the desaturation phenomena as you go from cervical incisor or as you go from palatal to the labial surface the chroma of the dentine would reduce and that is how you will also layer so you will add more chromatic layers in the depths to develop a chromatic core for example let's say the amount of defect that you want to repair is that much okay the tooth got fractured at the junction of cervical and middle third and now you want to build that tooth back up now when you are building that tooth back up we know that as the junction of cervical middle third dentine is slightly more chromatic so you're going to put a little more chromatic shade there now this shade has to be put in a wet shape fashion now you need to imagine that you have already a palatal shell which is built and you are layering a highly chromatic dentine which is at the deeper aspect as you go as you start coming towards the labial aspect you going to be covering that previous layer of chromatic dentine with the another layer of less chromatic dentine and the final layer of the dentine will be the one that you have chosen as the final color of the restoration now for example here if the final color of the restoration that i wanted was A two, let's assume. I'm going to put A three point five as the deepest layer. Then I'm going to put A three to cover that up, and then final dentine that I'm going to be layering will will be A two. Now it all depends on how big the defect is. If the defect was let's say this big, which is a junction of middle and incisal one third, then you need to just maybe put two increments of composites. So in this case, I'll just put A two and A three. If my final shade and the top layer will be the A two. So remember, how do you define what color needs to be or how are going to reduce the chroma? Is but first define the final color of dentine that you want. Let's say the final color of dentine that you want is A two. Then the immediate layer below that A two will be A three. and if you're putting three layers then the the layer beneath that is going to be a3.5 that's how you go if the if the top layer is a3 then you need to put a3 as the top layer then bottom layer beneath is going to be a3.5 and then again the 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 one which is deepest is going to be a4 so that's how you will develop a chromatic core and if it's only one one incisal one third which is fractured i'm just going to put one layer of composite which is the final shade that i want and i'm then i'm going to cover everything up with it. in am that's how you generate color with dentine but then you need to ask yourself if you're putting so many layers the first the foremost thing you ask need to ask yourself is is it predictable is it repeatable and most importantly is it simple because when you are trying to put so many layers the thickness of each increment of layer will influence the final result if you put more a3.5 and less a2 the result is going to be different so the accurately controlling the thickness of layers is very important so when you try to put so many layers there are chances that you can falter that you can make a mistake that things can go wrong okay i'm going to excuse every lady today who's yawning because i know you've been up at 4 or 5 in the morning huh? so that's okay you can have your cup of tea you can have you can take a break and all that stuff all right now let's try to simplify this and not try to have so many layers so now we just put so what i do now is i just put two shades or at least one shade or two shades of dentine or a body shade and that's it and i try to simplify my stuff so look at what i've done i've created a palatal shell with enamel and proximal walls with enamel and the and the bottom layer that i have one layer that i put is a3 at the highest where the cervical one third where the tooth is more chromatic and then i'm going to cover sorry i'm going to cover everything else with a2 dentine okay I make my mamelons there and then i'm going to cover everything else with enamel and if you look at the proximal view you will see that the dentine is more chromatic in the proximal cervical one third and as you go to the incisal one third the chroma reduces and that's how i would generate color with dentine and that's the formula on the left hand side if you see of your screen if i want the if i want the final result to be a1 then a1 will be my topmost layer of the dentine if i want the a2 then a2 will be my topmost layer of dentine or body shade or whatever that you've chosen as the final shade of your restoration okay <clears throat> so i think you i think things are easier and easy for you to understand what would define the final color and how can you generate color with dentine okay let's look at enamel layer let's look at what gives color to the enamel okay 
what how does enamel influence the color or the value remember enamel is the one that controls the value of a restoration which means the enamel is the one that is going to control how white or how gray your restoration is going to look <coughs> Now the reflection, transmission, and light absorption of enamel structure makes enamel a very complex optical system. Okay, if you look at the enamel structure, the combination of a highly translucent enamel prisms, okay, and the opaque interprismatic stance, substance in between, makes enamel a translucent and a high-value substance. Now this is like an oxymoron. Okay, this is like an oxymoron. How can anything which is allowing the light to transmit so beautifully be of be can can be of high value or can look whiter? Remember, I told you opaque subjects which do not allow the light to transmit will look more whiter. They will have more value, whereas the translucent objects which allow the light to transmit easily will lose their value. They will become more darker. Here we have. a structure which is made by god so beautifully that it does not lose its value even if the thickness increases for the natural enamel when you increase the thickness of the natural enamel for example at the cuspal ridges or wherever if you increase the thickness of a natural enamel it starts to become more whiter it starts to become more it has it not only becomes more translucent but it also becomes more whiter all right so this is a huge 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 problem for all of us as long as composites are concerned why because if composites are placed in the same thickness as enamel the optical integration will not be achieved so traditionally we were trying to replicate the dentine with dentine layer and the thickness of the complete enamel with the enamel composites and then people started to realize when they started doing that the final result was not of a higher value but it dropped in value and therefore it started to look more grayish so then they realized that there is a problem why is this happening why does it happen this happens because of something called as a glass effect so transparent and translucent materials will lose value as the thickness increases they become more grayish or blue and your composites in effect behave like glasses okay they will lose brightness and when i'm saying composites i'm talking about enamel composites here which are more translucent so your enamel composites behave like glass they are very translucent structure they are intentionally made that way because the light has to transmit so that dentine beneath can show itself they lose brightness as the thickness increases okay and this is because of the mismatch of refractive index so when people started to understand that if i replace the enamel natural enamel with the same thickness of the composite enamel then i will not the optical integration is not happening why is it not happening is because the refractive index of the of a natural enamel and composite is not the same now why is it important for you to understand refractive index is because refractive index is how the light changes in speed and direction when it goes from one medium to the another when it goes from air to water it bends that is why when you place a pencil in the water and you look from the side the pencil appears broken that's because air and water have different refractive index however if you take a pyrex gloss rod and you put that pyrex gloss rod glass rod in a beaker full of glycerin and you see from the side you will see that the pyrex gloss glass rod disappears in the beaker it's like magic why does that happen because pyrex glass rod and glycerin have the same refractive index and because it has the same refractive index the light does not bend when it passes through glycerin and through the pyrex pyrex glass rod it does not bend and therefore you cannot distinguish the boundary where the glass rod is or where the glycerin is similarly if you want your composites to blend seamlessly with your natural enamel you have to have the composites which have the same refractive index as enamel if a composite has the same refractive index as enamel no matter how much thickness you place the composite in what will happen it will blend seamlessly because the light will not bend the reason you see the demarcation line or your effect looks gray is because of the fact that your that the refractive index does not match now there the scientists are working on this as we speak there are a lot of there are they are trying to make materials 
especially enamel composites to match the refractive index of natural teeth, which is 1.67. We have a material called as mycerium. We have a material called as mycerium, which is also, also called as HRI composite, which is high refractive index composite. This material blends seamlessly with the enamel, even if you increase slightly the thickness of the, or you place them in the same thickness as natural enamel. Because we don't have this material, so what do we do? What do we do to match the, to, to, to overcome this mismatch? Can we do something? So the trick is, the solution is that you place the enamel composites in thinner layers than the natural enamel. So if your enamel composites thickness, for example, your natural enamel thickness is one millimeter or 1.5 or two millimeters, then you need to reduce the thickness of your composites by half, which means part of the enamel, natural enamel thickness has to be covered with the dentine and then the rest has to be covered with enamel. You understand what I'm saying? If you try to place the enamel in the same thickness, enamel composite as the same thickness as natural enamel, then the integration will not happen. The result is going to be very grayish and you will see that the demarcation line is very obvious. So what you have to do is the part of the thickness of the natural enamel has to be replaced with your dentine composite. And then you can need to leave only 0.5 to 0.7 millimeter space for the enamel composites to be placed. When you do that, the refractive, because you're reducing the thickness, the light does not bend as it would have bent if the thickness was greater. It has to level, it has to travel less distance and does not bend and therefore it's sort of refractive index matches and that is a hack. So between one third and half of the total thickness of the enamel should be reproduced in enamel composite. Now, a mistake that a lot of people do is when they're trying to close the diastemas with only enamel shade of composite because they think the dentine is inside and we just need to add enamel composite, that's it. And, that's, and you'll see the result looks, looks very great. And this is what I did so many years back and I had no knowledge about all this. What is layering? What is dentine? Jobi composite, whatever you get, whatever is, is there in the clinic, you just put it without any knowledge about the optical properties or what, what the end result is going to be, right? So let's look at this in and try to understand this. So if you put composite dentine, that's a composite dentine and that's a, that's a natural dentine. And you're trying to replace the natural dentine with the same thickness of composite dentine. And then you're trying to replace the natural enamel with the same thickness of composite enamel. What will happen? It's gonna lose its value. It's gonna lose its value. You're gonna see the demarcation line. You will see that it looks more grayish, more darker. All right. So what you need to do is you need to put your dentine composite right till here. So part of the thickness of the natural enamel also has to be covered with dentine and the rest that you've left is to be covered with your composite enamel. I hope it is clear to you. Okay, so try to do this. And what is the thickness of composite enamel that you need to place so that it does not affect the value? And you can see all the effects of dentine and everything, but it does not alter the value of the final value of the restoration. So this study was done again, done by all these people, beautiful, amazing people. And they realized that 0 0.5 mm modifies without lowering the value. So the minimum thickness or the maximum thickness of the enamel composite that you can place is 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 millimeters. Now it again, remember, depends on the refractive index of the composite they're using. These people did a study with Z350 XT material from 3M. Now, if you have a different material from GC, from Tokayama, from Ivoclar, you need to talk and understand and play with the material to see what is the thickness that works without altering the value, okay? There are certain companies will say that you don't put this composite material more than one millimeter in thickness. Don't put this enamel shade more than uh, one millimeter in thickness. So you don't have to, to go beyond one mm because if you go beyond one mm, you will end up having a restoration which has lack, which, which has low value. Now, how do you measure this 0 0.5 millimeters? So they gave us this instrument called as anterior mesura. Now, I don't use this instrument very often and I'll show you what I do in my cases. <clears throat> but yes, to start with, you can, you can use this material, this, this uh, instrument. I'm gonna show you how you, so you place this instrument like this. You put a dentine shade complete, you complete the entire, you make a parallel shell, a proximal wall, and then you put a dentine shade. 
When you put it in teen shade, put it in mass. Don't worry about the excess. Then you take this instrument and you place it like this. So the junction of the smaller end of the instrument, the bigger junction is placed at the cable surface. And you move this instrument in a mesodistal direction. When you keep it in this direction, touching the incisal edge at a 45 degree angle, when you move it, the excess dentine is going to be removed. So when the excess dentine gets removed, the space that is left is only by 0.5 millimeter of enamel. So there is no guesswork and it gives you a pretty accurate, not very accurate, I would say, but pretty accurate but I am not really a fan of this, but I, I'll tell you why, because you cannot use this for veneers. If you're doing direct composite veneers where there's no intact labor surface to give you guidance, then you cannot use this instrument, okay? So <clears throat> I prefer to use putty indices, and I'll show you how I use those indices in the coming cases. So enamel composites should only be half or less than half the natural enamel thickness in most situations. Opalescence and translucency are two essential characteristics in selection of enamel composite. Now remember, enamel composites are the composites which are more translucent. Dentine composites are the composites which are more opaque. And then you have something called as a body composite. What is body composite? Body composite is a composite which has an opacity and translucency, which is balanced. It is neither too opaque nor too translucent. So where would I use body composite? I'll use them in incisal one third, where the chroma is less. I'll use them in the middle third, where I'm using, where I'm replacing class three work. And also for highly chromatic body shades, I'm gonna use as one body shade when I'm doing class five effects, okay? So opalescence and translucency are the characteristics that of enamel composites. Now you can avoid the glassy effect and those grayish effect by optically control, by optically using optically efficient enamel composites and accurately controlling their thickness. So what is very most important is to control the final thickness of the enamel composite. If you get that right, then your result is be the one that you want. If you, res, if you get that wrong, then either it is going to be too opaque or it is going to be too grayish. So that balance is required. Okay, so this is what is called as, so as you know, let's talk about layers, okay? Now we know that as the thickness of the composite increases, it also increases in opacity. It'll become more opaque, okay? No rocket science in, rocket science in this. But when you join two materials of different characteristics, one opaque and one translucent, then it is a different material, or different structure altogether. Let's say you have A2 enamel, and A3 dentine. You put A2 enamel in that thickness and A3 dentine in greater thickness, and that is the final result that you get. Same composites, A2 enamel, A3 dentine, if I alter the thickness, the result is different. What does it mean? It means that <clears throat> it is absolutely imperative to accurately control the thickness of increments you are placing. Even though you are placing the same shades, but you're altering the thickness, the final shade changes. Okay, so this is very important to understand. So let's look at, so as it's depending on the transfers in opacity, we have four types of composites available with us. One is incisal. What are these incisal? So incisal basically is nothing but a very, very transparent composite which are required to mimic the opalescence. What is opalescence? I'm just going to come to that in a while. Okay, which is going, which are very transparent effects. So, so those different companies will have also, you need to learn the terminologies. So different companies will have different kind of terminologies for this. Some people will call it incisal. Some people will call it opal. Some people will call it trans opal. Some people will call it clear translucent. Some people will call it all those. So some people will call it translucent shade. Some companies will call it incisor. Some companies will call it opal. All is, the terminology is different, but the effect is the same. They, they serve the same purpose, especially to be placed at the incisor one third or on the label surface. Then you have enamel, which is more translucent, okay? Which is less translucent than the incisor and more translucent than the body shades, and then you have a dentine shade. So dentine shade is the most opaque, incisor is the most translucent, and then you have a balance of opacity and translucency, which is a body shade, okay? So that's how you are going to understand the shades. So when you say, 
A2, A3, A4, A3.5, all those companies, when they say A2, they do not specify whether it's dentine or body. It is understood it is body. Some companies will specify it. Some, some companies will say, for example, Z350XT says, it defines shades, shades as A3B, A2B, which means A3 body, A2 body, A1 body. For dentine, they write A2D, A3D, A3.5D. For enamel, they write A3E, A2E, A1E. So some companies will define that. Okay, some companies don't. Tokama, Tokama bought dentine shades, they define as OA2, OA3. So there's like opaque A3 shades, opaque A2 shade. So this is what is a dent. Basically, they're talking about dentine shades because dentine shades are more opaque. So you need to understand the terminologies. Now, when you have you have a lot of people, I'm sure you must be using tetric and serum, Ivoclar. So tetric and serum, it just comes A2, A3, A3.4. Basically, they are just body shades. But if you look at the IPS Impress or Tetric Evo Serum series of theirs, they have e enamel shades, they have dentine shades, specifically A2 enamel, A3 enamel, A3. You understand? So you have to understand that terminology is very, very important to understand that. Now look at this bluish effects. So can I have water? <clears throat> can I have warm water? So look at this. Beautiful, beautiful picture again by Tushar. Look at those bluish gleams of light that you see in Sazil one third. Those mammalon structure that you see one third. This is called as opalescence. Owing to the translucency of the material, you see all these effects. Okay, opalescence is an optical phenomena in which, which causes the iridescent appearance of an illuminated body when the angle of light is changed. So when you, <clears throat> when a natural light hits the incisal one third, of the tooth structure, the low wavelength of the light, they reflect back, which is the blue. Blue is a low wavelength. Red and orange are the higher wavelength lights. So lower wavelength of light, they, so it basically acts as a selective filter of the light. You understand? Certain materials are very translucent. They allow the light just transmit like that. Certain materials, for example, the opalescent shades, the incisal shades, they are the shades which act, act as selective filters of light. Selective filters, ka matlab hai, it means that they, do, they allow some wavelengths to pass through and some wavelengths are reflected back. So they allow the low wavelength to reflect back and the higher wavelengths to pass through. When that happens, the low wavelength, bluish wavelength, they reflect back. They will give the bluish effect, also called as halo effect that you see in the incisal one third or the opalescent effect that you see in the one third of the incisal one third of the tooth. Now the same light, if you, under the transmitted light, it looks as orangish. Same effect, under reflected light will look bluish. And under the transmitted light, if I put a light behind the incisors and the light is coming from behind the incisors, then it is going to look amberish or it's going to look more orangish. This is called as counter opalescence. And because of the various, we have these materials, you know, we have these materials which act, which act as selective filters of light for us to mimic this opalescence. Look at that. Look at how beautifully you can mimic the incisal one third. You can see the opaque incisal edge. You can see the mammalons inside and between the mammalons and, and the opaque incisal edge, you can see this bluish opalescence. Okay, this is under reflected light. This is called as opalescence. Now, when I put the light at the back and allow the light to come through it, it looks more amberish, it looks more orangish. And this is called as counter opalescence. So same effect under the incident light will look will look bluish and under the trans, under the um, transmitted light, it is going to look amberish. Okay. So this is how you can achieve the effects and you can use this incisal op opalescent shades to simulate that effect. Now this is called as, so this is the design. Of, so your design of opalescence, your design of opalescence will depend on the design of your mammalons. Some mammalons will reach till the incisal, incisal edge. Some mammalons will stay short of incisal edge. And there is a space between the, between the mammalons where the dentine is ending and the enamel one and enamel edge. In that space is where this all opalescent effects happens. Now, this is because of the natural arrangement of enamel prisms in the incisal one third. Why it looks like that? Why it acts as a selective filter of light? Okay. Now, if you look at the incisal edge, it is also opaque. 
It is not made of dentine, though. It is all enamel. Incisal edge is all enamel, but it still looks opaque. Why? This is because of something called as internal reflection of light. So incisal one third, because it has a 45 degree angle or a 70 degree angle. Incisal edge is never blunt. It is always like a edge. It is like a 70 degree edge. Because it is like a 70 degree edge, the light, there's an internal reflection of light. So light does not transmit, it reflects internally. And therefore this entire edge, edge looks like opaque, it becomes opaque. And the color of this is usually the color of the dentine that you have, okay? And you can simulate all this effect. And between these two opaque structures, that bluish opalescence that you see, and this is called as incisal halo. halo. So if, you're in, if you have an opaque incisal edge and you have opaque mamelons, and then in between you have this beautiful opalescent effects, this is called as incisal halo. Okay, for incisal halo, you need to have an opaque incisal edge. Then only it look like a halo. All right. So highly translucent opalescent masses are, are used as an enhancement for the final layers when trying to recreate this pronounced blue areas. You see this, I've done, I've created the incisal halo, I've created the mamelons, you can see the bluish translucency, all this thing with enamel composites. You can achieve all this with the beautiful brands and the optical properties of enamel com of the composites that you have only if you understand them, only if you practice with them, only if you try to do this work, you, you hit the bench, you work on on teeth, and that's how you achieve. So when it comes to layering, let's revise. You have a palatal shell, which is made of enamel composite or a highly more translucent composite. So in a palatal shell always has to be made with an enamel composite or with, a, or with a very transparent or a translucent material, okay? Then you have opaque dentine as the inner layer. And then the final color of the dentine that you want is the topmost layer. That's the final color of shade that you want is the final color. And then you cover everything else with the enamel. If you can, if you see in terms of thickness, you will see that the palatal shell should not be more than 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 millimeter in thickness. Your enamel composite at the top that you're layering should not be more than 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 millimeter in thickness. Inner dentine can be, of, can be of any thickness, does not matter, but you need to control the thickness of your palatal shell because if you make the palatal shell too thick, then there'll be less space for the dentine shade to be put. So you need to accurately control the thickness of the scaffolding, the, the proximal scaffold. The, when I say scaffolding, it means your label enamel, your proximal enamel, and your palatal enamel. Inside is all dentine. So you need to control this thickness and that's very important for the final result to look nice, to look, to be nicely integrated with the rest of the tooth structure. So recognizing the distinction in thickness, color, and its morphology of dental dentine enamel, it is necessary to replicate this histological tissues and composite restorations, okay? And always you need to ask yourself, is this predictable? Can I, can I do this? Am I getting, if I follow a recipe that you have in your mind, would I get predictable results? Would I get repeatable results? And is it simple? And that's what you always work towards simplicity, okay? Now let's talk a, a bit about shade because that's something that troubles everybody. Now, if you look at a Vita shade guide, dental companies will try to match composites to a Vita shade guide. And that's probably what you guys mostly do. So when a patient comes to you and you want to do a shade selection for the composite, you'll take a Vita shade guide and you'll try to match the most close color that you get. And then you do your, okay, it's A2. The final color is A2. So let me just, okay, what does the company say? The company says for A2 shade, you need to put A2 dentine or A2 enamel or A3 dentine or A2 dentine or A3 enamel. And then you go and you go by the recipe. And then if you do not accurately control the thickness, things go wrong. Okay. And most often than not, you will also end up choosing a inappropriate color if you use Vita Shade Guide. Why? Two reasons. The first reason is Vita Shade Guide is not made of the same material of composites that you're going to be using. Your composites have a different optical properties. This is a plastic made of something else like a silicon or something. So it, you can, it does not work. How can you compare 
the color of two different materials which and, and then try to get the match you cannot secondly if you look at the vita shade tab it also has a desaturation phenomenon right cervical is more saturated as you go to incisal one third it becomes less saturated now what part of that a3 tab did your companies match the color of the composite to did they match it with incisal one third or the middle one third or the cervical one third because the, then the color is going to be different okay but this, this is completely a3 so what part of a3 tab did the company match to so a simple exercise that i want you guys to do is you take a vita shade tab you take your composite and then you place your composite on the vita shade tab and see what part of vita shade tab does your composite come closer to of course you cure the composite first so take a composite dab 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 on the side of on one side of the tab maybe just one half of the tab just place the composite there and see what part of the vita shade tab does the composite come closer to does it match in size one third is it so what will it give you the this exercise will help you know whether your composite if it becomes if it comes close to cervical one third it is me it means it's more opaque if it comes in if it comes closer to incisal one third it means it's more translucent that's one exercise that i want you to do okay <clears throat> another exercise that i want you to do is i want you to open the syringes of different brands of composites that you have okay so if you have dentine shade or enamel shades of same enamel shades of different brand of composite for example you have of Zun, one of z50 xt one of kur one of kulzer one of ivoclar just try to open them and and hold them together and see if the color matches you'll be surprised you'll be surprised now this is a a2 enamel of different brands of composites okay do they all look the same they don't look at the composite from kur tavokur it is so opaque it's so chromatic it's an enamel composite for heaven's sake and look at the ivoclar composite it has more value it is more it is more whitish and look at the enamel of it so it's more so you see same shade of different brands of composites are never alike that's why it's important for you to see and understand the color of the composite syringe that you're using that's why it's always better to match the color with the composite that you're using if you match the color with the composite you're using using you will never falter the color is never going to change because that is the composite that you are finally going to be using on the patient's mouth okay so it is always important to do an exercise of making your own shade taps now this is a customized shade tap that i made with two shade guides Uh, two composite two brands of composites which is z350 xt from 3m also called as uh, supreme filtech in some parts of the world and then you have ips impress from ivoclar and i've made these shade tabs according to the by accurately controlling the last thickness which is the top most enamel thickness in all these shade tab is 0.5 mm the rest is all dentine and if you look at the first shade tab and if you look at the third uh, uh, first second third if you look at the fifth shade tab which is d3 e3 of IP, ips impress and a2 d and a3 enamel of z50 xt you will see that they match however however that z50 xt is going to give me a2 shade whereas this is a a3 recipe a3 shade recipe for ips impress so for ips impress if i want a3 shade i need to use d3 dentine and e3 enamel in controlled thickness but the, what is the final shade i'm getting it's closer to a2 and i have done this mistake so many times so i've realized with ips impress if you want a2 shade you need to use d3 dentine so because the opacity and the chroma of the dentine of ips impress is not all that chromatic it's not all that chromatic so you see that if you don't do this exercise you will never ever be able to get good results so for a2 as a final result with ips impress try using a3 dentine okay if somebody is using ips impress try this and you'll see that you'll come closer to a2 as a final shade all right Shalom.
So you need to, or you can make your my shade gap from Style Italiano. So you have this shade guide. <coughs> uh, you can make your own shade guides with the brands of composites that you have. And this is an amazing shade guide from Style Italiano. You can, it takes not more than five minutes to make the tab. So you can make a tab of shade guide of any brand of composite that you have in five minutes. And in fact, you can train your assistant to do it. It's so easy to do this and you can make this different kind of shape apps. Or if you don't want to do all that exercise and you feel lazy, you can use this called as button try technique called as, this called as a button technique. So you can use this button technique with the same composite you're using. I'm gonna show you how to do this. This is also very quite predictable. And most of the time I end up using this and I also use my customer shape that I've made with the composites that I use. Whenever you're taking shade, so the first thing that we've learned is you need to match the color of the com of the tooth with the com composite that you're using, okay? Or make your own customized shade guides. That's the first thing that we learned in shade matching. The second thing you need to learn is you need to take the shade before the teeth have, uh, you've isolated the teeth with rubber dam or before you've isolated the teeth or retracted or, or, or chosen to use the cheek retractor if you don't want to use rubber dam. So when you use a cheek retractor or use a rubber dam, within three minutes, the teeth start to dehydrate. And when they dehydrate, they increase in value. They become more whiter. Because they become more whiter, you will end up using or choosing a shade which is more whiter. For instance, if, the, if you look at the top picture, the shade is probably A3. And if I look at the bottom picture, it looks like A1. So if you take a shade match after dehydration, you will end up choosing a shade A1 and it is not going to optically integrate. After two or three days, the patient is going to tell you, you know what, the color does not match. There is a problem. So always do shade matching before the teeth dehydrates and that window is three minutes, always to be done within three minutes. So color matching analysis must be performed before complete isolation when the teeth are fully hydrated. Look at this case here. Of course, we did a full mouth uh, reconstruction with the composite in this case of the anterior teeth, but I'm just gonna show you, just focusing on two, one right now. This is an immediate shade or color or match. That's immediate after I removed, after I finished and polished. Of course, it looks slightly more chromatic and looks like the mismatch, there's a shade mismatch, right? But you also, important to understand any corrections that you want to do in your previous work has to be done once the teeth have completely hydrated back, which means you need to wait for at least four to five days before you start to evaluate the final color for any corrections that need to be done, okay? So obviously there looks like a color mismatch, but look at what happens after 48 hours. So there is so much of difference, see? Look at this and look at that. You can see all those fracture lines and crack lines that are simulated in the restoration clearly, and it does not look as grayish as it was looking in the previous picture. So all these composites, you see, this is the, this is the previous picture. And this is mono shade. So this two one is layered, the rest are all a single shade composite. Just one body shade. Do they look bad? No, that's what I'm trying to tell you. So you need to understand where layering is important. You need to understand where a single shade would work, okay? <clears throat> so take a good picture before starting the color matching process. When a, when a patient walks into your clinic for any sort of anterior restorative work, the first and foremost thing that you need to do is take your DSLR camera out and take a picture in different exposures. Take a picture in normal exposure, take a picture from oblique view, Take a picture of smile, take a picture in your uh, low exposure, because in low exposure, you'll be able to see all those mamelons and opalescence and all those effects are only visible in low exposure. Shalom. All right, so take a good picture before starting the matching process. Make sure that the color match is done while the teeth are hydrated. We talked about that. Always match the color under daylight illumination of 5500K. Now, how do you get the daylight illumination of 5500K? You cannot match the colors with a chair light. 
you cannot match the color in your daylight in, a, in you cannot your your 5500k illumination happens at around noon at around at around 11:30 to 2 pm you can't keep all your aesthetic cases at that point of time to match the color so what do you do it's very difficult to get color correcting light to have color corrected lights in your clinical practice it's very very difficult so what do you do so if you have a digital camera as i said photography is imperative if you have a digital camera you don't have to worry about anything why because you can set your white balance to 5500k it's so easy when i set the white balance of my camera to 5500k the light that is coming out of my flash has a temperature of 5500k so there is no problem because i'm taking a picture in that setting it works absolutely amazing so all your good digital cameras will allow you to customize your white balance so you can customize your white balance and get it to that temperature that you want okay measure the color with the restorative material that is chosen for restoring the teeth okay we already talked about this so a couple of points that you need to keep in mind i love using what are the instruments that i use i love using this micro brush only problem is wear downs we talked about this you have to use it with a modeling resin use it wet don't use it dry it leaves the fibers there okay another thing that i love using absolutely love using is my brushes okay advantage the composite does not stick you have to use modeling liquid with them only disadvantage is you cannot uh, autoclave them and you can and they quickly wear out okay so i'll show you how to use this and of course my favorite instrument when it comes to direct composite especially when it comes to uh, adapting the labial part of the composite label surface of the composite is your opera sculpt from ivoclar i love this opera sculpt pad for ivoclar it's an amazing material amazing um, sorry instrument the composite doesn't stick gives a very smooth surface you don't have it doesn't leave the instrument marks that are there sometimes or the instrument marks that are left on the composite material so decreases your time for polishing and finishing all right and of course you need to use the brushes and instruments uh, with your modeling resin so the modeling resin that is available in india is the one from um, besco modeling resin you also get from kar you also get from gc okay so uh, and these are the instruments that i use uh, for all my work lmart instruments i love them and of course i have told you i use this number 25 brush that i showed you last time let's talk about the gray margin or the hiding the margin that margin that you see or the interface the junction of the tooth and restoration how can you hide the, how can you avoid having that okay what are the things that you can do to not have that junction that really irritates you at the end of the restoration so first thing is always match the color with the composite that you're using never use a vita shade guys as ultimate reference okay now we need to talk about this couple of things when it comes to hiding the margin so first and foremost thing is the tooth preparation so tooth preparation is very important so when you have a a, a a fracture like that you need to condition the tooth so as it receives the composite restoration without any leaving any sort of debris without leaving any sort of marks so you need to refine the edges first the first and foremost thing is if you have ragged edges if you have rough edges you need to smooth in them with uh, by keeping the burr at 45 degree angle now the burr that i use is a fine grit red diamond burr okay that's what i use and i i define the and i have smooth and sharp margins with that once the margins are smooth with the same burr at an angle of 60 to 70 degrees i'll give a long bevel and when i give this bevel the depth of the bevel starts from the dj the bevel is not just like a small thing that you did it has to start from the dj it has to have this curvature and it has to and you need it for 60 to 70 give a long bevel of 1.5 to 2 to even 2.5 mm at times okay that's how far you need to extend the bevel so once the bevel is extended then you need so because you've used the burr the burr is going to leave some rough marks it is also going to leave some loose enamel rods there and those loose enamel rods have to be smoothened otherwise when the composite shrinks they're going to break and then you see the elusive white line there okay so make sure you polish the bevel then you polish the bevel with softlex disc and this is the most 
convenient way of beveling. Once you smoothen the bevel with a soft flex disc, you're basically converting the bevel into a infinity bevel because the soft flex disc will touch and you then you know where the where the bevel is going to end. There is no sharp line where the bevel is ending. You need to have an infinity edge starting from there to there. And it's important to have this infinity edge to for the composite to blend seamlessly with your good structure. Okay, that's very, very important. If you just allow your if you just allow your bevel to be just till here, and then you layer your composite just till here, and during finishing and polishing, you remove the composite from here, you will see a demarcation line. You have to allow the bevel, your composite should go right till here, and should cover a sound to structure like that. And when you're finishing and polishing, you gotta make sure that you do not remove this part. And, and remove this thin layer of composite. If you remove this thin layer of composite, and then you see the interface between the composite and the tooth, which is seen as the demarcation line. Okay, we're gonna talk in more details in the coming slides about this. Okay, so that's infinity edge, that's your infinity bevel. So you have an inner, inner bevel line, which is at the DEJ, and you have an external bevel line, which is has an infinity edge. So let's look at this plastic tooth. Obviously it's a plastic tooth, it's an opaque tooth. You are using translucent materials. It is not going to blend, but let's understand how you give the bevel, okay? So you, if you do not finish the sharp margins, you will end up having demarcation lines. You need to finish the sharp margins. You use this kind of a grid bar, give a long bevel, 2.5.2 millimeter, the depth of the bevel is tilted from the DEJ to the top. And then you use your disc to finish the margins. So that's a wide bevel. And now you have that infinity bevel. You cannot see that obvious line here, this obvious line that you see. You cannot see this here. It is blending, it is going seamlessly. It can go anywhere, it is ending anywhere. You don't know that where it's ending. Okay, that's what you want to achieve. Once you get that, that's the final, and then you polish it, of course, with the help of silicon carbide polish. So once you use the disc, polish the bevel properly. And now you can see that there's no, inf there is no edge. There is no edge of the, of the superior, of the edge where, the, where, the, where you think your uh, bevel is ending. It has infinity edge. And now you layer it with a composite. So you go from there. So the, that's what you want to achieve. And then I just put some composite layer and put some stains and everything. But look at how it is still seamlessly blending. It is not, there's no obvious demarcation that you see, even though that's a plastic tooth, okay? So this is how you're gonna get long bevel. Look at, the, look at the extent of the bevel there, okay? It extends so much towards the facial surface. Don't think, oh my God, this is not conservative at all. Oh, I'm removing so much of tooth structure. I have to be conservative. No, 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 no. You're not hardly removing any amount of tooth structure and you need, some things need to be done. You need to do this. If you don't do this, you will never have seamlessly, seamless margins, okay? Don't, don't think about, look at this old composite we need to remove. And this is the tooth preparation. After preparation, look at the huge, extent of the bevel there. That's how far the, extent, the bevel is extending, beyond the line angles. And then you add composite, look at, and then and polish the bevel properly. Look at how beautifully it is polished. You can see that light reflection. And then you just blend the composite, see? The composite blends seamlessly. That's what you want to achieve, all right? So tooth preparation, very, very important in order to understand and hide the demarcation line. Shade selection, we already talked about it. You're not going to use Vita shade, shade guide as final reference. Okay, we can use color match analysis must be performed before complete isolation when the teeth are fully hydrated. Okay, you need to color match with the material that you're using as a final color of final uh, material of your restoration. Okay, we talked about this as well. Then composite layers, this is very important. Remember, we were talking about the thickness of the layers. If you alter the thickness of the same shades of composite, the final result is going to change. So, and that's what I, so this is what I've done. I've taken a plastic tooth and I've intentionally put a enamel mass of composite. I did not put any dentine in there. I just replaced the incisal one third with the enamel mass of composite. And you can easily see the demarcation line, isn't it? 
and the result is so grayish it has lost its value if you look at the black and white image it looks more darker what do you understand by this that if you put your enamel masses in greater thickness the final result is going to be more grayish more darker okay i know this is a mistake a lot of people do when they when there's an incisal edge chip that is there and you just put an incisal mass there and so and it does not blend because it looks more translucent it looks more grayish okay and let's look at this case here so the patient has nail by by biting habit bone incisal edges i made a palatal shell and then i am going to put some dentine shade or a body shade there i cannot just put one mass of enamel composite there you think the enamel incisal edge is made of composite in of enamel comp, enamel so i'm going to put just enamel composite there no you have to put your body shade in order to hide the black background and then you put mamelons in the body and then you finally cover with the enamel in limited thickness and then you finish and polish now you do not see that translucent enamel edge you see it blends seamlessly it does not lose its value this is after 48 hours so remember to accurately control the thickness of the last layer and we know the golden figure is 0.5 to 0.7 mm that's very very important to remember and we have an instrument for this lmr instrument for the beginners you can start using this instrument especially for your class 4 defects or your class 3 defects all right but eventually over a period of time you will get a hang of what is the thickness of enamel that you want to use so in terms of controlling the thickness and how you can how to use this instrument this is how you use it you place in a, you place you make an enamel um palatal shell with enamel composite then you put dentine completely fill that area with dentine then you take your instrument which is your lmr instrument and you keep the small end where it meets the bigger end that thickness is actually 0.5 mm you keep that at the cave surface margin and you move it in a meso distal direction once you move it in a meso distal direction what happens it is going to remove the excess dentine and now the space that is left is for your enamel composite okay and that's how you will accurately control the enamel thickness so remember natural enamel you don't have to replace that completely with the composite enamel you have to put some opaque shade or a body shade or a dentine shade to a certain degree of thickness of the natural enamel and the rest you have to build with composite enamel composite now you will also see that this demarcation line does not appear when you are layering this usually appears when you start to finish and polish so when you are finishing polishing suddenly at one point of time you are like oh my god what is this it was not there before how did it happen you know so you start what start wondering oh my god okay why does it happen is because you removed remember the thin layer of composite that has to be on the infinity bevel and has to blend with the tooth structure when you do over zealous finishing and polishing you remove that thin layer of composite and then you come to the interface where the composite and tooth were joining you did not cover that part of the infinity bevel so when you remove the composite from the infinity bevel you will see a demarcation line so don't be very over zealous with your finishing and polishing don't use discs so i know you guys love discs you want to have more discs you want to get lots of discs because you love using this on the label surface i hardly use disc on the label surface if i have to use disc on the label surface that is only to remove a lot of excess if there is and sometimes to get the planes right that's it but i use them very 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 judiciously and very carefully i always mostly rely on my burrs for finishing the label surface because i can control the speed of the burr i can control where the burr is touching with disc you cannot control where they are touching because of the wider circumference so that's something that really bothers me and the discs are very volatile especially people love coarse discs they love coarse discs okay i if you do if you use coarse discs and you remove that thin layer of enamel on the on the infinity bevel and you are done then and then you will see the demarcation line and then you are like, oh my god what to do okay so always leave a thin layer of composite which is blending with the infinity bevel okay 
So let's talk about class three composites. Okay, let's take a break of five minutes before we start with the cases. Oh, good, everybody is awake. Okay, how's it going, guys? How's it going so far? All good. Good, sir. Is the speed okay? Very yes. nice, sir. Yeah. I made it like a story for you so that you understand the importance of everything. <clears throat> These small little things are important. Huh? For tooth preparation is important. How much you finish and polish is important. Thickness of layers is important. Everything, small little details. You, if you focus on all those small little things, then you can you get predictable results. Sir, so we can use coated instrument like. Yes. What do you mean? What do you when you say coated instruments? What do you mean coated instruments? Teflon coated. No, I don't recommend Teflon coated instruments. There is no need for Teflon coating if your instruments have good steel, and you use uh, uh, clean instruments. There's no need for Teflon coating because Teflon coating instruments, they will lose their, tef their, their coating after repeated uh, autoclave cycles. And then you are in a mess. So always use clean instruments. I use style Italian instruments, which are, which, which are not coated, which are just plain stainless steel. And they do not rust. You, I autoclave them twice or thrice in a day and they do not rust. I've been using them for past seven, eight years now. Uh, the first setup what I'm using. So the, the, the thing about, your composite sticking to instrument is because the instruments are not clean. That's one thing. Second thing is you apply a lot of pressure in, in putting the composite. Composites are very delicate. If you, try, if you press the composite more, the more it's going to stick to your instrument, then it's going to stick to where you want it to stick. So don't put a lot of composite, or a lot of pressure when you're trying to adapt the composite. The second thing is you need, the second thing is you need to Ask your assistant to have alcohol wipes. Is that disturbance? So, can I speak up? Somebody else's mic. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So clean your instrument, ask your assistant to keep cleaning. After you put one increment, you place the income back on the tray, your assistant should clean it immediately. So that's what I do. My, my assistants have alcohol pipes. So the moment I place the instrument back, they will clean it and, and keep it ready for me. Okay, or they clean it and hand it over to me. Okay. Uh, so Teflon coating definitely not required. Just keep the instruments clean. You can also coat the instrument with the, where is this disturbance? Modeling. You should all go on mute. Reach on what you're getting. Somebody can you, can getting you all go on mute for a moment? Can you all go on, go, go on mute for a moment and see when I speak? Is there reverberation in the sound? Yes, it's the reach on what can, uh, See, the reverberation is gone. Somebody's, somebody's mic is, is creating a problem. Okay, so you can, you can unmute when you want to speak to me, okay? So let's keep it on mute. Like that. So, uh, where was I? Oh, you can also coat the instruments. You can also coat your spatulas or your instruments with a uh, modeling liquid, but ever so slightly. Okay, ever so slightly. I'm gonna show you. I think I showed you in the posterior composites how to use and how much modeling liquid to be used. You need to blot it with a paper, and then you need to use it. Okay, that's the amount of modeling liquid you need to use. Don't do a lot. Of, don't put a lot of modeling liquid. Okay, so let's uh, let's catch back. let's let's get back in five minutes. Excuse me, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, sir, I have a question. Can... Who's that? Manini. Uh, oh, Deepika Shah. Deepika. Okay. Yeah, sir. You said that we have to uh, finish uh, after making the bevel. Like hmm. after, uh, sir. Can you tell? Uh, can you tell the importance? Why do we have to finish? Uh, actually, we then uh, we have also like we are going to. Uh, uh, do the procedures like itching and bonding, then why do you have to finish? Because I, I already answered that question. Now you tell me why do you have to finish? So actually, uh... <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I'm just, I'm just, 
So you have to finish because once you use a rough burr, there are chances that you have enamel rods that are broken there, right? You have fractured enamel rods, right? Your prisms are fractured, right? Now, if you do not remove those prisms, when you adapt the composite and you cure the composite, what's going to happen? The composite is going to shrink. Right. So when the composite shrinks, those loose enamel rods, those fractured enamel rods are going to break. Mm -hmm. And when they break, you will see a white kind of a demarcation line there. So you've got to make sure that there are low loose enamel rods anywhere. That's why you finished with a disc and then you polish it later on. You need to have a smooth enamel surface to which you etch and bond. Now, I know what your brain is thinking. Rougher the enamel, oh, yeah. greater irregularities, <laughs> oh, greater the adhesion. Right, right. I, yes, I yes. No, it does not work like that. You're not working, you're not relying on mechanical attention, Deepika. We are relying on chemical adhesion. Of course, I mean, not chemical adhesion, but mechanical adhesion. But we do not require that kind of interfaces for mechanical retention. We are, there is a bonding that is happening. And bonding will always happen to a clean enamel surface. It will be much better bonding there than to a rough surface. We are not luting. We are bonding. So there's a difference. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, can you please repeat, how did you make the customized shade guide? Uh, I got confused in that. <clears throat> so customized shade guide is made with the, you have to have those um, shells. You need to have those empty shells from uh, GC. Okay. And then you fill it up with the dentine shade that you want. So basically in shade, we have three types of uh, shades. One is for enamel, one is for body, and another is for dentine, right? Yeah. So in customized shade guide, what I use is I use a dentine and an enamel and that's it. I don't use a body shade. But Achha. you can make a customized shade guide with body shade also. Okay. You can and make so a customized shade guide with body shade also. And then okay. you see, then you match, take that customized shade guide. And you do the color matching with the customer shade guide. And you okay. select the tab that you think is, is, is most appropriate. And then you already know the formula of how you made that tab. Mm. And then you, you know the thickness that you have to use to get okay. that shade. Okay. And sir, you talked about the layered and the mono layered technique. So we apart from that. the uh, tooth structure, which is left. So what is the indication of... Uh, we'll talk about where... that when I come to places. Okay. No? Okay, sir. And so one more thing I wanted to ask that while taking a photograph for a value, like before or after the composite, which we have done. So uh, for the shade selection. So is it that you take a colored photograph and then convert it to black yeah. and white? Yeah. Okay. Or before uh, DSLR no, has an uh, no, option? No, I don't change Okay. I don't change the settings at all. I just click the picture, cut, 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 cut. And then okay. I do the do the post um, uh, ed editing, whatever is done on the computer, I just convert it into mono shade and that's it. Okay. And sir, uh, which software do you use for all this uh, uh, making it black and white or for I the I use patient? it on my iMac. I use it on my photos Achha. on iMac. So I just okay, do it there. Sir. Okay, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, so that's all. That's how you do it. So where is the best place to buy the LMRT kit? Is it like a dealer in each country or? Akshay, you bought the kit, no? No, I have a kit, but I'll buy one more. I only have one. So you have the dealer's DM dealer. You have the... DM dealer, no? No, no, no. Yeah, I was checking it online now. So Australia, there is some troll dental or something. It's showing up. Ask, ask uh, Abhi, no? He knows. Yeah. He's the one who... So, he had so got already. Yeah, he had given it to me. Yeah, yeah. So LMR, um, I think... Uh, I'm going to check with my LMR dealer here. They probably hmm. would get in. They probably would know a dealer in Australia. Yeah. If you could, that would be awesome. Hi, Akshay. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Hello. I, I, I would be needing help from you guys because I think I'm only based in Adelaide. And I don't know. I was trying LMRT instruments in Adelaide here. So I was struggling a lot of with that. Like, Don't worry. I'll find out. I'll all. find no, out. Because I'll I was find... checking it out now, now while talking. I was checking it out. And there, there wasn't like a 
straight up place where you could go to that's why yeah yeah it. yeah i'll find out i was thinking out, like if you guys are ordering stuff maybe i can chip in together with you guys like because i don't know much things to go here in south australia fair enough like that's if okay. i find one i'll i'll get in touch with that's you that's okay right? i'll but, i'll i'll find yeah. out akshay i'll can i'll share sure. the details with you i'm going to talk to my almart guy and i'm i'm also in touch with almart people in in sweden finland All right. Yeah. Oh, it's not. It's yeah. not difficult. I'm just going to put a mail to them, and they're going to send the dealers in Australia, and then I'll forward the okay. number to you. Thank you very much, sir. Not a problem. Uh, Thank you, sir. That uh, Tejas Bhai from Philadelphia, I cannot contact him. Can you please uh, just confirm for his number? And also, I it's the same the number. Scene. I've been talking to. There are a lot of people who probably would were getting were able to get in touch with him on that number. Am I right or wrong? I called What? him three, four times. I don't know why. Uh, another guy was picking up, and sir, for the stains also, I ca- called this Bhavin Patel. He said we don't have the stains available right now. It doesn't come because the car company has stopped. Uh, oh, Kavukar has stopped his operations. Yeah. Yes, Kavukar have stopped his operations in India. Yes. So you need. So then the only option that you have is to buy stains from Ivukla. Okay. Tetric, tetric, and color. so it's it, that's the one i use for my ochre stains and for my uh thing you have a tetrican color uh, stain i'll show you it's that uh so you 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 don't have any option then then you need to buy it from from ivo club okay so let's so uh, now the basic question aman preet here uh what exactly do you ask your assistant to use for wiping instruments in between the layers because that can be very messy if it's not done the right way wipes of what wipes i have this calzis wipes ah got it got it. the lens wipes lens wipes calzis wipes okay Then i use those i use those um or the, you, you can even use a very less saturated cotton of ethyl alcohol that works fabulous thank you so much it gets dried very quickly so you just play it, take some ethyl alcohol some cotton very very desaturate that Okay. And just, just, just two seconds to clean it. Make sure, but it does not leave any remnant of cotton That's fibers. Exactly why I asked. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I, you need to use. So I prefer using Carl's Ice. But if you don't have those Carl's Ice wipes, uh, I got this huge packet of Carl's Ice wipes when I was in states. I still have those. I have a pack of about five hundred wipes. So I'm still using those. Yeah. I bought it for specific of this purpose, not to clean my lenses, but to clean my instruments. So let's uh, get going with the cases, and uh, things will become more clearer to you as we go on. Okay. Uh, so we'll talk about class three now. Now, <clears throat> so this is a case where I used a very interesting case uh, where I used a customer shape guide. I used button try technique. and i use a beta shade guide also to confirm my shade so I, so i realize that if i'm able to get the same recipe with my customized shade guide and with my button try do i get this i wanted to confirm do i get the same uh, recipe or not so this is what i did in this case so obviously uh, all the things have to be done before all the shade matching has to be done before isolation so i'm just trying to check the a hue I just use beta shade guide to see whether the hue is correct or not. Okay, so obviously, as I told you, eighty percent of the people will fall under A hue. So you really don't have to take out the entire guide. Just take out A tabs, A one, A two, A three, A four. And most of the time, the color will match. And then I'm checking the chroma. So I'm realizing that A two is more whiter, A four is more darker, three point five more darker, A three is a balance. Okay, so I'm sort of still, okay, looks like A three is more balanced. So when I'm checking chroma, what I'm checking, what am I selecting? Am I selecting enamel shades or dentin shades? I'm selecting dentin shades, right? So when I check chroma, I'm selecting a dentin shade right now. So for my dentin shade, according to my customer shade guide, is A three. Okay, that's what I'm chosen, and then I convert the same image into black and white. And when I convert the same image into black and white, Manini, you'll see that the same image has been converted, and you see that the A2 is more has higher value. A3 has a decreased value. A3.5 sorry has a decreased value. A3 is the balanced value, and I'm going to go with sort of A3 in this. So value check is done. So my 
So if I look at my customer shade guide, according to my customer shade guide, what is the recipe that I have for dentine and enamel shades? So for dentine, it's A3 dentine. For enamel, it's A3 enamel. Okay. And then I do a button try. How to do a button try technique? You make buttons on a piece of paper already. Take a paper pad, make a piece of buttons already taking the composite out of the syringe. Make sure the buttons are about three millimeter wide and they're uniform and even and they're not rough. Okay. And then uh, immediately retract. When you retract, immediately place the buttons on the teeth. How do you place the buttons? You can place the dentine shade buttons on the cervical one third because dentine is more pronounced in the cervical one third. And then in the middle one third, as the chroma is decreasing, the body shades come into play because in the middle third, there is a balance of opacity and translucency, which confirms to the body shades. And in the incisal one third, you can place enamel shades. Once you've place those shades and you have to be quick because you have to do everything in th within three minutes. So if you isolate, put a retractor and then you're taking out and making the buttons and placing it, then the shade match is gonna be wrong. So make the buttons beforehand, make, be, make them ready and then immediately transfer it onto the patient's teeth, cure them nicely for about 20 seconds and then you take a picture. Once you've taken the picture, remove the buttons, ask the patient to close the mouth, tell the patient to relax for two to three minutes. In fact, what I do is I do this exercise the day one the patient walks in. So when the, when the patient walks in, the first thing that I do is I take the pictures and I do a shade selection. I do this exercise of, of shade selection on day one. And then I'm going to maybe do a rough mock-up for that patient, adjust the mock-up in the patient's mouth, make a putty index, and then let the patient go. So the entire exercise takes not more than 15 minutes for me. When I don't have time, I'll ask the patient to walk in. I'll take a picture. I'll do that. I'll do the uh, button try technique, sheet selection thing all done. Then I'll take a, any, any composite. I'll, I'll take a dark of, of the composites. All I will take the lightest of the composite so it does not match. But sometimes the patients won't come back, okay? So I'll take the most horrible of the colors of the composite, and then I'm going to do a mock-up. I'm going to adjust the shape. I'm going to adjust the occlusion on the patient's teeth. Everything is done. And then I'm going to make, I'm going to take a putty index, make a putty index. And then I ask the patient to leave and recall the patient again for the next appointment. See, this is what happens when patients, when people go in and out of the meeting, I have to stop everything. And the thought process goes for a toss. So I did this. So now once you've taken the picture, you have to do some alterations into that picture. So what do you do? You make copies of the pictures. I make three, I duplicate the picture. And then I, on the, on the second picture, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna increase the contrast and decrease the brightness. So when I increase the contrast and decrease the brightness, the dentine color, color shines through. So when the dentine color shines through, what I'm gonna see in that is, I'm gonna see which part of the tab almost merges with that color. The dentine. So here it's very obvious that A3 dentine and A3 body are the closest that are merging. So I'm going to be choosing these as my shades for dentine and body. And then for the same image, the first image, I'm going to convert it into black and white. And once I convert it into black and white, I'm going to see what enamel shade of tab incisal one third matches and gives me the closest thing. So A3 enamel is the closest. So my recipe with which I got my shade selection, which I got my button try technique is A3 dentine, A3 body. Sorry. So the final recipe that I got was A3 dentine, A3 body and A3 enamel. That's my final shade selection now. Okay. And then the rest is so easy now. No? So I'm going to do the following the same principle. We isolate, we pre-wedge. Pre-wedge is going to protect the dam and also it's going to cause separation. So that it gives us a tight contact. Okay, I'm going to remove all the decay, refine the prep. The proximal wall is built first. Why proximal wall is built first? Because the label wall is completely intact in this case. So if the label wall was not intact and it was a through and through defect, then I will build the label wall first and then the proximal wall. Okay, so I'm going to show you a lot of variety of cases as to how different ways to skin the cat. Okay, I'm using the posterior matrices in a, in a longitudinal fanner 
manner because they've got a they have a very beautiful profile that confirms to the proximal profile of the anterior teeth and then i'm going to build a proximal wall so once the proximal wall is built then the rest is like a class one cavity which i'm going to fill according to the recipe which is a3 dentine and a3 enamel and i finish everything up okay it does not take a lot of time the only time that is taken is building the proximal wall and imagine remember the proximal wall thickness also has to be controlled it should not be more than 0.5 to 0.3 millimeters because if we increase the proximal wall thickness then there is no space for the dentine layering and then there's no space for mammillon layering and remember that increased thickness of proximal wall give you that grayish look in the proximal wall area and then your finishing polish i'm going to i'm going to come to the finishing polishing in details at the end so i'm going to just quickly go through this so use uh, i use it has cups in this and uh, eve polishers and that's the final polish and the gloss that you get okay is recall after 48 hours and then i recall the patient again to do the final selection of the shade if there's any alteration to be done or if there's any overhang that i left anything so i call the patient after 48 to 72 hours then i use my aluminum oxide polishing paste in this to give a final polish that's the emergence profile that's after one year okay Let's look at this case. Class three defect. So, what did we use to build the proximal wall? We used the posterior metrisis in this. Okay. So, let's come to another case. Class three. So, this is a case when I recently bought the bioclay metrisis. So, I, I just bought the bioclay metrisis and I was itching to use it. And I said, okay, this is a case I'm going to use with bioclay. Though I would have Easily, I made my life more easy by doing it with the way conventional way that I do it. But I thought I'm, I have to learn bioclear, so, so I have to start somewhere. So not this case, I was hell bent that I have to do it with bioclear. Though this was not an ideal case for bioclear, but then I thought, okay, let me just try this. Okay. So again, remember where would I use mono shades and where would I use layering? So in the first shade, in the first case in class three, I did. Layering. Okay, we did. We chose enamel shades. We chose dentine shades. We chose body shades. Now, over the periods of the time, I've realized that the body shades of Z fifty XT or Filtex Supreme are so beautifully balanced that you actually don't have to use multiple layers and falter because when you use multiple layers you can falter right you have to control the thickness accurately with body shades you don't have to worry about the thickness you can use one body shade in any thickness and it does not lose its translucency it does not lose its opacity it creates that balance which is there and if you look at the class three effects where the class three usually happens is the middle third of the tooth and the middle third of the tooth is the area where you have the balance of opacity and translucency it's neither too opaque neither too translucent which is just like body shade so for my all class three defects now, mostly I tend to use only one body shade and that's it. Okay. And it gives me amazing results. So I don't trouble myself for choosing an amyl or dentine shades for my class three defects. So in class three defects, I will just end up using one body shade. Okay. So here I am trying to select the body shades. I put A3 body on one tooth and A2 body on the other in the middle third. And now I'm in that, um, uh, I'm perplexed because I'm, I'm now thinking that A3 body matches with the cervical part of that area and A2 body matches with the middle third and incisal one third of that area. So which one should I choose? Okay, so I, I checked the chroma and I was fine. And then I checked the value that also confirmed that A3 is one which is, so what do I do in such a case? Because I have to, I'm hellbent that I have to use mono shade in this case. Because I have to use bioclear. So when you use a bioclear metrisis, bioclear metrisis, you don't have an option of, of layering. You do injection molding. So you put a flowable composite and you push a packable composite of one body shade and, you're, and you just finish it and polish it and then you're done. Okay. So let's see what I did. And I thought, let me just experiment with this. All right, so then look at how rubber dam makes your life so much easier. Look at where the papilla is in, in between two incisors. The moment I place a rubber dam, there's a retraction of the papilla. 
So this is important because this is what is going to give you a good emergence profile to your restoration. Okay. So, and when I pre-wedge, there is separation of the teeth as well. So always use rubber dam and pre-wedge when you are doing anterior work. Okay. And now what I do is to you know it's very difficult sometimes to know where the composite is ending and where the where the tooth is starting. So you can use this cerebrum that we use for selective caries removal. Just move it once around the area so it's not going to damage the tooth but it's going to make it give you a nice, very nice demarcation where the composite is ending and where the tooth is starting once you have that demarcation then you use your ear your turbine and you remove all the old composite and you'll see there is a huge secondary decay there you finish and polish the ball you can use soft flex discs you can use ipr strips to polish the interproximal and then finish them later with the soft flex um, strips and you get a nice surface always, but this margin, you have a lot of undermined areas and undermined margin in this area. Always make sure you have a nice butt margin here and don't lose, leave any unsupported enamel there. Okay. Now, this is what I've chosen. I've chosen a bioclear matrix in this case. Okay. And this is the matrix I've chosen. I've stabilized the matrix with a composite weld on the other tooth. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what are bioclear matrix? Just to Quick thing about bioclimatizers, they're anatomically shaped 15 micron plastic strips. Okay. And they have this customizable contours. The beautiful thing about bioclimatizers is that you can easily stabilize them in the space that is between the dam and the sulcus. So between the teeth, they go into the sulcus and dam actually pushes against the matrices and stabilizes the matrices. Okay. It allows the injection molding of the composite without any cervical overhangs because of the beautiful seal that you get with these matrices. Okay. Look at that, how the matrix is stabilized between the teeth and the rubber dam. So it gets an automatic stabilization as it goes into the sulcus. Now, there are a sequence of things that you need to follow with bioclear. The first thing is biofilm removal. Okay. And for that, you need to, so the selection of matrix. Then there's injection molding with heated flowable and had heated packable composite. And then there's finishing and polishing. Okay. So I use air polisher. You need um, the biofilm mover. You need, you need to have air polishing. You can have aqua care or you can use this that is plaster that I use. So you, I use 50 micron aluminum oxide or trihydrate in this case. If you look at the choice of matrices, there are different terminologies. You have A101, A102, and 103. Where do you use them? Uh, sorry. These are the regular matrices. These are the regular matrices. Okay. A101 is for upper mesial. 102 is for upper distal. And 103 is for lower interiors. Similarly, you have diastema closure matrices, which are more contoured. So you have DC, which stands for diastema closure. 201, which is for mesial diastemas. DC202 is for distal diastemas and distal and 203 is for diastemas in the lower interior teeth for smaller matrices. Also, sometimes you have huge diastemas and you have DC204 in such cases. That is a profile. So DC101 for regular diastemas, DC202 for distal diastemas, and DC203 for lower diastemas. Okay, and you have DC204, which is a higher contour when the diastema is huge. Okay. And you have A102. And you have DC202. So A102 and DC202, what is the difference between a regular bioclear matrix and the diastema closure matrix? The regular matrix is less curved. It can be used for class three small black triangles, whereas your DC basically is basically meant for more, is more curved because you want to have that beautiful emergence profile and closure of diastemas. It is therefore used for large black triangles and for larger space closures. That's where you use them. So then I etched and bond. Uh, shall I have a phone? Just check. So you etch and then you bond and then you injection mold. So, okay, so injection mold, I put a flowable and then I put a pushed a packable. So what do I, so what did I do to get that balance of color? Because it was A3 and A2 both. So I said, okay, let me use the A3 as flowable and A2 as packable. And let me see if I get the right balance. So I use the A3 flowable and I use the A2 packable. Okay, and that's what I did. And then I covered that up with my, Teflon because I don't want the composite to stick to the other side. And then I stabilized that matrix to the composite weld. And then I etched and bond and did the similar thing. 
So it's a controlled. I love to don't have a lot of access when I'm doing this because, and even though if I get a lot of access, I try to remove the excess and mold and shape it before I cure it. Otherwise, it it takes a lot of time. See, bioclimatrisis it looks very simple. That we just have to push in and then it's done. It's not that simple because you need to have in-depth knowledge about anatomy and about how much to remove. Because once it sticks to the tooth, then it's very difficult. When you have to reduce this much thick mound of composite and to and blend it with the tooth, it's a lots and lots of hard work. So I still prefer to do control buildup. So that's what I ended up with. Even though I removed a lot of excess before I cured, still there is so much of excess that needs to be. So now the hard work starts of finishing and polishing. Okay, so I'm going to remove very carefully using discs or using my, my um, red grid diamonds, and then I'm going to define the line angles. I'm going to smoothen the entire surface with my cups and cones. So you get the line angles there. And then I'm going to finish and polish this, giving some textures and everything. Remember, you have to remember one thing. Huh? What is it that you need to remember? Your composite is not, so even though the defect was like almost still here and almost like here, even though the composite is, is extending, that is how you are going to get, that's, that's what happens when you create infinity margins. And that is how, why it was going to blend. And you can see that before finishing, you can see some part of the composite here as well, which needs to be reduced. So your composite extends that far and then you have to very selectively remove it, okay? So then you finish and polish, this is the palatal side. And then I've removed all that bit of composite that was there. That's how, that's after two weeks. Now, I was really worried at this stage. I was worried because I thought maybe I got the contact way too up and now I'm gonna have a black triangle there. Okay, and then I recalled the patient and said, let me just have a look and recall and see how it goes, how the papillary fill takes place. So this is after two weeks, this is the oblique view. And look at how the papilla is filling. I was still concerned about the black space there. I said, my patient's gonna tell me everything looks fine, but I have this black thing here and I don't like, and I have to do some touch ups later on. But this is a complete papillary fill after I think five or six weeks. Okay, look at that. So when you finish and polish and then that's how it goes. Okay, let's look at another class three defect, uh, a rotated tooth, okay? And what is the best way to do this? Okay, so obviously there's a decay there. I use A2 body, remember I use only one shade for A3s now for my class threes now, one body shade. I do the shade selection, I'm marking the dam, I'm gonna invert the dam. Dam inversion is very important, especially when you are doing class threes, which is closer to your papilla or your gum margin. Your dam really helps because it retracts the papilla, especially the medium consistency dam. It is going to retract the papilla. It is going to give you good emergence. You have good access to removal of the caries without making the dam, all right? So that's how it is. So I'm inverting the dam. You can do it with floss. You can do that with a spatula. And then because I want greater amount of retraction in that area, I'm using a floss tie, okay? We have talked about this when we did the rubber dam web black, okay? And then now I'm going to see now, and then I put my wedge, I trim the wedge, mostly I will remove the extra wedge because it interferes with the movement of the burr sometimes. I'm sure you must have all realized that. So I trim the wedge, I just want some separation, I want to protect the dam, that's all. And then I remove the decay conservatively from the palatal side, and now I am air blasting and cleaning that area. So when you are air blasting and cleaning the area, please protect the adjacent tooth with some sort of a matrix or some sort of Teflon or anything because that area is gonna get rough then and attract plaque later on, okay? So that's how beautiful and nicely the surface looks. And then I finish, and in, I finish the infinity bevel. That's how that tooth is prepared now, okay? There are no loose enamel rods. The, the, the surface is clean, ready for bonding. And such rotated teeth, bioclear really helps, especially if you want to, you know, so I'm checking the bioclear matrix, I'm seeing the profile. So, so you see, you can't have one 
matrix is going to fit all situations. You need to have different kind of matrices. Sometimes it takes me about five to seven minutes to select the appropriate matrix. I will try a posterior matrix. I am not happy with the contour. I'm going to discard that. Then I'm going to take my bio clear and see if it works. I'm, I'm not happy with that as well because it's probably distorting. So I'm going to remove that as well. Then I'm going to see, okay, maybe I'll use my mala strip and see if I can build the proximal wall. I'm not happy with that. I'm going to discard that. Sometimes then I'll use my anterior matrices from Garrison and see whether that helps. So I'm going to see what matrix gives me that appropriate shape that I'm looking at without having to do lots of finishing and polishing. So you can't have just one solution, one thing, okay, I'm just going to use Mala pull for everything. Mala pull for everything may not work. It can work when it requires lots and lots of practice as well. So, so look at this. I get a beautiful curvature of the, of the uh, you know, proximal form of the lateral incisor. And I'm happy my backlay matrix is automatically stabilized. Uh, within that sulcus area, so I don't have to worry about anything. I further use a wedge to stabilize it. I etch, look at how much, how much I'm etching. So one of another ways of getting that infinity margin and seamless margin is to etch always beyond what you are restoring. Why? Because you don't know where the compass is going to end. You don't know where it's going to end. And you don't want to overly finish and polish and, and then in the end realize that you got to the area where the infinity bevel was composite was, and then you expose the infinity bevel and you have a demarcation line. So always etch and beyond, put your bonding a layer, and then I'm injection molding this now. So when I injection mold, look at the amount of composite that comes out from the palatal side. So much of access that is coming out. I'm going to remove that access before I cure it. And this is the label aspect. See, so much of composite. And now the hard work starts. So it looks very simple, to, it's, very, it's quick, but then it takes more time for finishing. So the, actually the time gets balanced. So it's not like you do injection molding, it's quick. It's not quick. Okay, so gross shaping in the proximal profile of the, of the teeth, always I use discs to get uh, the proximal profile at a very slow speed of about 5,000 to 7,000 RPM, especially when I'm using coarse discs. Why? Because coarse discs are very volatile. Okay, then I'm going to finish and polish. I'm going to, we're going to talk about the finishing polishing protocol in the end, so don't worry. And then you need to understand, see, remember, the labial form is important, but Palatal form is also important because palatal form will define the hidden quality of the restoration. Remember, a long lasting restoration would depend on how did you place the palatal form. You need to understand that palatally, proximally, always there is a marginal ridge. You need to recreate the marginal ridge in order for you to have good function and for nice disocclusion that happens when you have incisal guidance. And you need to create this. So how did I create this? I left the bulk of composite there and I did a selective removal of the composite. So with my football shaped, I did a selective removal of the composite, just removing where I need it. And when I removed where I needed, I automatically got this elevation of the ridge on the parietal aspect. Okay, so that's the label surface final. And that's the final, that's IOPA check. So that's one way. So we've used, bi we've used BioClear. We've, we've seen how to use BioClear in such cases. Let's see what else can we use. Okay, so that's the defect that we need to repair. Okay, so we isolated everything. Now look at what I'm trying to see. I always try to simulate and try to see the adjacent teeth. So if I'm doing a lateral style, I'll see a contralateral incisor and I'll see that the contralateral incisor has a beautiful mesial ridge. And also I can see a mesial ridge before I, dis before I uncover the lesion, I can see a beautiful marginal ridge there. So that has to be simulated, okay? So isolate, you start removing, you start remove the decay, finishing the proximal margins, this, see, that's rugged, okay? You can't leave the margins like that and expect a good result or get seamless margins. You cannot get seamless margins if you have such kind of rough uh, contour of your cavity prep. So once you've done the prep, you need to refine the prep, okay? So remember to butt the margin, clean it nicely, and then you etch it, put a bond. Now, what I'm using here, I'm using a proximal vary strip. Now, this vary strip is a contoured mylar with, with, with little more thickness than the mylar. Okay, so it's like almost 75 microns in thickness or 50 microns in thickness. So it's basically a contoured mylar strip. Okay, you get this from Garrison. So it's called as very strip. Okay, 
and I've stabilized the very step with, with the wedge. And now I'm going to build the proximal wall and do an injection molding there. So yeah, I've done, see now I'm done, no injection molding. So I've done a controlled buildup of the proximal wall. So this is a controlled build. I want that elevation to be there. So a lot of people, you're just going to fill that up flat and make it flat. Don't make it flat. Try to get that bulged there, okay? Palatal anatomy is, is as important as label anatomy. So I've got that bulge that I wanted. And now I'm going to very selectively finish and polish proximal fine. It looks good. Um, a little excess that I get on the proximal here, I'm going to use my 12 number um, BP to remove that ball pocket braid. And I'm going to remove all that excess and then I'm going to cure under glycerin. I'm using a bar parker to remove that trial number. All looks good. Look at them. And this is after finishing and polishing. And that's what I wanted. And that's what I got. I wanted that beautiful proximal profile there. And that's what I wanted. And that, so you have to have that picture in your mind. You need to understand in beforehand what you want because only if you know what you hand, your hands will move automatically in that direction. But if you don't have the picture of what you want, then you don't know what to, what you'll get in the end. So you need to for, for things to be more predictable, the end has to be in your mind. Okay, so that's after hydration, or then we recalled him for polish. That's how it looks. Okay, that's after post hydration. So let's look at another case. You have a class three, adjacent class threes, okay, between incisors, central incisor and lateral incisor. Again, shade selection, body shades. We inverted the dam, lateral floss ties here, and a pre wedge. Remove the cavity, remove the decay, refine the prep. That's how it looks. So I'm matricing, I'm using a, a polydentia posterior matrices. These are uh, basically coated matrices. Okay, so they are, the composite and stick to them. They're black in color. Okay, and then I am very, in a controlled fashion, I build, I do injection molding there. And then I remove the excess. This is all bonding layer that has come out. Okay, and then I remove the excess, contour it, and I, and I finalize this completely. Look at the beautiful marginal ridge that is created in that area. And that's what you want as the end result, okay? So then I am using the, I'm finishing the enamel margins. I'm matricing wedge separation again, stabilizing the matrix with a wedge. I do injection molding. So when you're doing injection molding in a through and through defect, you have to do injection molding from parietal side also, and you have to do it from your buccal side also. Okay, you have to get it from both sides. And then the finishing polishing starts, the hard work of getting the line angles right and getting the marginal ridges right. Look at beautiful marginal ridges of both the teeth here now. You can see the mesial marginal ridge of the lateral, the distal marginal ridge of the central incisor. And that's from the label aspect. Okay, beautifully mirror-like polish. You'll get every time you do it. Yeah. So let's look at another case. I'm just trying to show you different ways of doing class threes. You can use posterior matrices, you can use various you can use Mala strips, you can use anterior matrix system garrison, that's where you're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to be using this case as a fractured composite that needs to be treated. Okay, so we remove this. Now, these kind of defects are very challenging because they are sub gingival defects, okay? Look at that, decay, deep decay. So I've trimmed the papilla a bit to facilitate the rubber dam inversion and wedging. So we are acquiring the margin as we talked about in posterior composites. We are sort of acquiring the margins. So I did some trimming of the papilla there. Now I've got a beautiful inversion there. Okay. Now I, I know, I know a lot of, 
I know it looks like in sequence when you see these slides, it seems okay. You do this, you do this, you do. This. I know, but to get that inversion, to get that rubber dam in place, it it has taken time. It has taken effort. Okay, it's not in sequence. You think it looks like one thing after the other, but not. It takes time to to get everything into right into the right order. Okay, so rubber dam in place. Then I remove the decay. So whenever I'm in doubt that I'm very close to the pulp, I'll put the rubber dam first because I don't want any contamination if it's I'm very close to the pulp with the saliva or anything else. So I put the rubber dam and then I'll do the carries removal. Now that is a profile that I desire, okay? So I mostly do all my class three defects <coughs> extending to facial surface by clear, okay? But I don't like the excess contour. Sometimes that you get the by clear, you get a lot of excess contour, okay? And then it takes all the time to remove the fact that, that we already discussed. So this is the kind of contour that I want. I want a nice contour. I don't want to over contour the restoration. Okay. So these are the matrices that I tried. These are the matrices. There's a garrison anterior matrix system. Okay. The beautiful thing about this matrices is that you can, you can restore the labial and the proximal aspect in one go. If it's a through and through defect. And also it has curved wedges, which, which conform to the anatomy of the root when you're placing them. Okay. So these are the kind of wedges that you have different sizes, and that's the different sizes of the matrices that you have. Okay, the metal matrices are like paper thin. They are 15 microns in thickness. They're easy to slide in, and the wedge hugs the band automatically for maximum adaptation. Look at that, how beautiful it is hugging. The only drawback of these matrices, which I'm gonna share with you is, they are more straighter than to my liking. Okay, because I want the proximal form sometimes to be slightly more contoured, like just like the mesial, it's slightly more straighter. And we'll see how we corrected that. But then it was very beneficial for me to just have the initial form right, because I could do the proximal and the label from one go. It covers the label and the proximal. Okay. Look at how beautifully the wedge is adapted against the matrix. And then I injection mold. So you, so there's no hard fast rule that you can only injection mold with the bar clear matrices. You can injection mold with your uh, uh, metal matrices as well. It's just that after curing, you need to cure from the label aspect as well. Okay. So cure from the palatal, cure from the labial aspect as well. So all that excess flowable has come out. Then I'm going to shape it. And then I'm going to cure it. So that's the excess. Uh, as I said, I would like to have a little more curvature, like the tor VM matrices. But then what did I do? I to add more curvature. What did I do? I did a mylar pull. Okay. So I, I heated some composite. I put a mylar there going into the sulcus, and then I adapted the, the, the composite against the mylar and I pulled it. Take care. Once I've done this, I got a bit more composite there. And now I'm going to finish and polish and move the excess proximally with the help of 12 number blade. So I got a nice contour, which I wanted. This post finishing. And that's after polishing. And no time the papilla is going to fill up. Okay, and let's remember to get this beautiful ridge. Don't forget that. Don't, don't get flat uh, palatal areas. Try to always must endeavor to get those ridges there. Okay. Because class three defects will always have been the ridges areas. So don't make it flat. Always try to simulate it as a ridge. Okay. So this is after final finish and polish. And that's the label view. Okay. Let's look at one of the toughest the restorations you can ever do in interiors is a class four restorations. So principles will stay the same. The principles will stay the same. Okay. Uh, let's see different ways of handling this class four restorations. Okay. So this is a pre-op class four defect, two to lateral view. <clears throat> Always button shade techni technique. A3 body, value A2 enamel. That's my shade selection done for my dentine body for all the class four defects. For me, it is always layering. So for all class fours, I will always layer because anything that will reach the incisal edge area, I will always layer because you can't get that beautiful incisal edge anatomy with your uh, 
with your just mono shades unless the patient is a old patient and because of the wear he or she has lost all the incisal effects and you are doing veneering and you want to veneer in all in single color then maybe you can use a body shade but if you're doing a class 4 defect of a single tooth i would always recommend and i'll always do layering that is what my take is so the plan is to do this my plan is also to get the line angle right for lateral incisor the most important thing in lateral incisor anatomy and for its beauty is the line angle so make sure you get that line angle right there so isolation pre wedge these two central incisors are basically implants which are joined together so that's why i've done a split dam in between these two and the rest is all a regular dam i'm going to finish the bevel infinity bevel polish the bevel and now the prep is complete okay clean remove all the biofilm because you don't want to stick the composite to the biofilm the adhesion is going to be compromised remove all the biofilm air polish this smooth and nice smooth enamel to bond to always protect the adjacent teeth with teflon when you are etching always etch beyond what you plan to restore bond and then i'm using what is called as a finger technique or mylar placing a mylar and supporting it with a finger to build the palatal shell so basically use a finger to support the mylar and then you build the palatal shell palatal shell does not have to be built in flowable composite it has to be built with packable composite it has to be very thin close to about 0.3 to 0.5 mm and not more than that so the palatal shell is formed then i'm going to because the incisor ledge i want some effects i put a opaque incisor ledge i put the same dentine shade that i'm going to be using as a final shade in the incisor ledge area to give the incisor halo effect and then i mask the interface remember to always mask the interface now this is very important to understand how to hide that demarcation line now this is a, so the bevel maybe is still here okay but in this area where the where the where the cavity was and where the bevel is you must put a dentine shade which goes right and covers this part of the bevel the inner bevel that is one of the ways you will hide the demarcation line okay so your dentine more chromatic dentine should cover the part of the bevel not the complete bevel but almost half or two third of the bevel or one third of the bevel depending on how big the defect is all right so this is something i wanted to touch very important so put some opaque because when you put opaque dentine it is going to hide the gray black background the mouth ka background that's going to show through if it, you make it too translucent the gray background is going to go show through and then the result of the restoration is going to be too dark it is going to look lose its value so put a dentine shade and then i choose to put a body shade i've left some space Put in the body shade and incisal one third area to put some effect shades there. So I put some opalescent incisal effects there, and then I, lastly, covered everything else with a controlled thickness of enamel. Now, when I put an enamel layer, I put it slightly more in greater thickness than I want in the end because I want to compensate for finishing and polishing. When I finish and polish, I'll reduce it. This is after polishing. This is the final lateral view. that's the line angle you must get that line angle and this is important you must get this line angle always look at this it should simulate the line angle which is there on the adjacent teeth the reflections should simulate almost okay remember that okay so that's final after hydration and that's our final after post hydration and that's a value check okay how nicely the composite value is blending with the natural tooth value okay so another case very challenging case young guy son of a colleague of mine got up from the bed had syncope and then fell down and fractured the incisors and you know what happens when your child has fractured incisors especially if you are a dentist and your child is like oh my god then you're in so much pain oh my god oh, what has happened i'm very happy when it happens to somebody else because you earn money out of them and when it happens to your own child you're like oh my god you're distraught because now the child is going to have filling for the rest of his life and going to the filling is going to keep changing 
young chap, 19 years of age, came to me. Uh, so I'm using different brands of composite to see what, because when you are doing the work of a colleague, son of a colleague of yours, you have to make, make it look very serious. So I put a lot of composites there so that she knows the, the hard work that I'm doing. <laughs> anyway, different brands of composites there. There's SI composite system from Ita Style Italiano. There's, there's a Toko Emma composite there. There's Z350 XT composite there. I'm trying to match and see which color. And you can easily make out that A3 body looks very nice on the right side. And you, look at, you can see that the SIE enamel looks very nice. So when I increase the chroma, you can see that A3 body is almost blending with the tooth. And you can see that SIE enamel is almost blending with the tooth. So that's your chroma. And SI is the enamel value that I've chosen as a final restoration. Look at that. When I convert them into black and white, you can hardly see where SIE is. So I'm going to choose that as enamel shade. So the first thing is when I'm doing a serious work, and I have time. Now remember one thing, when I have time, and if you want more predictable results, always do a mock-up. Don't initially try to get into using a finger supported mylar step to build your palatal shell because you'll always be unpredictable. You, it's difficult to control the shape. It requires lots of practice. Whenever you have time, Always do a mock-up. So I don't use wax for mock-up. Mock-up does not take more than five to 10 minutes because I use a composite. I use n mass composites and then I shape them and then I cure them. That's it, it's done. And then I'm gonna use my, take my putty index and I'm gonna make a putty index. Now I know putty index, do you think putty index is a piece of cake? There are so many things about putty index that you need to understand, okay? Because what it, the putty index is the one that dictate, dictates the, the, the final uh, 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 way the restriction is going to come out. So the parental key is the key to successful layering. Okay. Now, when you look at the incisal edge, there are two surfaces of incisal edge. There's a parental surface of the incisal edge and there's a label surface of the incisal edge. Your putty index should not cross that green line that you see, which is the labial surface of the, of the incisal edge. It should not roll over the labial surface. That's very important. Ideally, putty key should be cut at the label extent of the incisal edge, okay? Remember that. Now, if you cover it like this, and then you make a parental shell, look at how thick the incisal edge is. You don't have space to put your incisal halo, to put your palisades, nothing. And the incisal edge is going to be very thick if you overlap the incisal surface with your putty key. So you have to trim the putty key till that green line. You have to trim it back to the green line. It should not cover the label surface, but should just extend till that label extent of the incisal edge. No, remember, this is very important. Otherwise, you will have a thick incisal edge and you will, which, which, which is going to look very grayish. You will not be able to put any effects, any opalescence. You will not be able to get incisal halo that you desire. Okay. When you make it thin like that, look at that. Now the incisal edge is so thin. It does not, it is not in thickness. Now you can put more effects to give it more thickness. I can put more inc incisal halo there. I can put an opaque uh, dentine there to make an incisal halo. I can put in opalescent effects there. Okay, so with no silicone covering the label surface, there is no excess composite label surface leaving enough surface for designing and no opalescence. So that's what you have to check. So this is isolation. And now look at this. It, my putty index does not cross the labels extent of the incisal edge. And that's what is important. So I'm checking the putty index. I have sometimes have to trim the putty index because I have a rubber dam in place. It will interfere in the seating of the putty index. I'm gonna show you how to trim the putty index when I show you a complete step-by-step -step, um, fabrication of a class four restoration, okay? So then once you have checked the putty index, everything is done, you are going to give, a, you're going to, give the bevel, long bevel, finish the bevel, all that what you've read, okay? So we're giving a bevel, then I'm going to finish the bevel with a disc. <clears throat> I'm gonna finish the bevel, smoothen it up, and that's how the bevel is gonna look. It does not have a have an extent, it, does have, it has an infinity edge, you don't know where it's ending. Okay, it's ready for bonding. Before bonding, I'm gonna mark the index where the palatal shell, where how much I have to place the enamel palatal 
to make the enamel uh, enamel composite to make the palatal shell okay i mark the index and then make sure the all the loose debris that has come out of marking you remove it with the help of a modeling liquid okay may take a modeling liquid and clean the putty index otherwise it's going to get incorporated into your composite okay so make sure it's absolutely clean index is marked then you etch and beyond and you wash it nicely have a nice frosty surface and then you put your bonding agent right so that's an infinity edge of the bond of the preparation now i have on the taking the putty out i'm going to put my enamel shell i'm going to make sure it's 0.5 mm in thickness how do i know that the moment i am able to see the putty beneath my enamel uh, composite it means i'm closer to 0.3 to 0.5 mm in thickness that's the rough estimate okay make sure that you take time be careful work mindfully so that you get this step very neat and clean and make sure that both 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 the palatal shells have not joined together there is a space there okay once i made the palatal shell then i'm going to place my matrices and place my wedge okay so that's a matrix check i'm checking the profile of the matrix i'm checking where the contact is which is where i want i'm checking whether i have enough incisor embrasure opening there i build the proximal wall with an enamel layer again in a control thickness of 0.5 mm and once that is done and then i'm going to stabilize this proximal wall with a wedge and then i'm going to build another another proximal wall with another tooth keeping it neat and then i'm going to remove everything so now we have a palatal shell we have a proximal scaffold ready the contact is all set and now i'm going to fill the interior with the shades that i've chosen so i'm going to choose the so remember the interface is with a dentin shade which is more opaque so part of the bevel has to be covered with that interface with that dentin shade and then i'm going to place the mamelons and cover the entire dentin shade with the mamelons i'm going to design the mamelons i'm going to leave enough space between the incisor edge and the mamelons for my incisor effects i put some incisor effect shades there some opalescent masses are placed there and then i cover everything else with enamel see such a controlled build up very less that i have to work on finishing and polishing in this case <clears throat> then i mark the line angles first and foremost thing is to define the shape of the teeth make sure they are symmetrically looking each other like like each other and then i use this burr this is a period um, cut burr from uh, comet okay this is what i use mostly for my label finishing it smoothens the composite very nicely and i can control it this is all done in slow speed of about 10000 rpm and then i remove the burr marks with my enhanced cups and cones and then followed by pre polishing with eve diacom spirals and then polishing with diacom spiral this is the final polisher and that's the kind of polish that you're going to get nicely defined line angles this tooth had lots of textures okay so i was tired at the end of the day so what i do is recall the page because i need also need to do some shade check after the teeth have hydrated so i mostly i will just do this much and do a little bit of texturing and then let the patient go i recall the patient after week 10 days and then i'll do the final if i do any if i need to do any corrections i will do it at that point of time and then i'll do the final uh, check so this is a lucida star felt with aluminum oxide polishing paste and that's the final gloss of the restoration you can actually see me taking the picture there okay in the tooth surface and that's how the reflections are that's the line angles defined and that's how the patient left obviously this filling looks more chromatic than the rest of the teeth because the rest of the teeth are hydrated okay so that we need to wait for dehydration to happen for rehydration to happen and then i recall the patient after the patient went this is oblique view so this is how when i recall the patients this is when i recall the patient post hydration then i'm going to give some secondary and the tertiary textures that the tooth had some micro and micro textures and then i finish and polish this again okay 
So that's how the patient left the clinic appreciately. So mother was happy, I was happy, everybody was happy. Okay, this is after two weeks post hydration. That's a close view of the tertiary textures that you see. Okay, and the close view of the secondary textures that you see. So class fours, you will sometimes want to, you have to do a lot of correction sometimes. The shade is not matching, maybe it got too opaque, maybe it was too less opaque or more uh, value decreased and you have to remove all this. But with the knowledge that you have now, if at the end of the restoration, the restoration looks very, uh, looks a bit darker or has lost its value, you know where you went wrong. You know that you put most, that you increase the thickness of enamel. So then you can correct it. If the restoration looks more opaque, then you then you know that you've faltered on the side of, of dentine. Sometimes on the incisal edge, you'll see dentine looking very prominent, which means that you've used more opaque dentine incisal edge area. Probably you want to use a more body shade there so that it does not look all that vivid and opaque. So once you understand this, you can correct it, okay? So this is a very, very emotional case for me because this, this girl came to me with this kind of feeling and some uh, sort of sensitivity in the teeth. She got this done a day before her engagement was her her engagement was to happen, and she was she had some class three caries and those black discoloration because of the caries, and she thought before her engagement, a day before her engagement, she's going to get that done, and she went to some dentist and she and he ex, he sort of I don't know, he joined these teeth and this is what he did. He I think this probably looks more like a GIC, and he chopped off the incisal edges as well because probably he thought they were interfering and he thought, she said it's looking high, so he chopped off the incisor edges as well. Obviously she could not go to her engagement like this. So the engagement was called off because of um, a lot of other reasons I don't want to divulge into, but then this is what happened. So this is what happened. So she was so distraught that she start, start, started looking at on the internet to, to find dentists. And she got in touch with somebody in, in Pune uh, to get this work. She was willing to come down to Pune to get this work done. And then that fellow was my student. He said, then why don't you, I'm here. Why don't you get it done there itself? Sir is there. So he, she came to me, referred by him. So look at that. Look at how high the pulp horns are. And looking at the IOPA, I was absolutely certain that this guy has encroached to the pulp because she had sensitivity to cold. She didn't have any pain, but she has sensitivity to cold. So this is I'm trying to do my shade selection. I'm trying to see if it's white enamel looks fine in sazel one third. Now this white enamel is actually an opalescent shade. Okay. It gives a beautiful opalescence. So I'm using Asteria from Tokoyama. I'm also trying to use A3 body Filtex Supreme and see if that works for me. So I've chosen the shade, the shade selection, chroma. And then I very carefully remove all the area because I was certain that I was very close to the pulp. I, want, I've, I went in there very conservatively. Okay, so before I went further than this, I thought, let me just isolate because I might even have to do a root canal, who knows? So I just isolated this first. So once the isolation was done, you can see the moment I place a rubber dam, there is separation happening. Also, there is a retraction of the papilla. Okay, and now I very carefully, now you can see on two one there, I don't know if you can make out, there is a pinpoint exposure here. You can see a reddish hue there. Okay, so the, the tooth was vital. She was, didn't have any signs of, clear cut signs of any irreversible pulpitis. So then I decided to cap the pup with Theracal LC. So I capped it with Theracal LC. Both the teeth were capped with Theracal LC and look at the pulpal exposure there as well. So I capped the thing with Theracal LC and then I cleaned the rest and then I etched so now I'm etching, right? So I'm etching beyond. Now I didn't have time for this because I'm using my mylar strip to build the pelvic shell. Now this really helps because now I can sit at the back and see where the midline is. What are the most common problems that you encounter when you when you're closing diastemas? The most common exam problems are that one tooth is going to look bigger than the other. There's a canting of the midline, either in this direction or in this direction. Okay, that's what happens then some, you don't get a very good emergence. That's what happens. 
right? So all these things are the are what happens with diastema. So you have a midline, which is not matching. You have a canting of midline. You have one tooth, which is looking bigger than the other, most common problem. And you have a lack of emergence profile. So that's what happens when you are treating diastema. So what I did was I measured the teeth. I measure, I built this up and then I measured it. And then after measuring, I built the other one. And then I, with a, with a parental, you can see my finger beneath it. You can see the glut finger. I'm supporting the mylar with a finger. I'm building my incisal edge first. I'm setting my incisal edge first. Then I put some body shade there. And now I build the proximal. Okay, so that's A3 body, that's A2 body, and that's white enamel in the incisal one third for opalescence. Okay, and then once I build the proximal wall, this is also called as front wing technique given by Jody Manuta, in which what he does is he'll do a freehand label buildup. In this case, I did a label buildup support with the help of my metriasis. And the palatal class three defect that was left later on was filled with injection molding. So this was done in three stages. Once first stage was inside the ledge buildup. Second was your proximal buildup. And third was your injection molding. And then I laying is complete. Then I removed, <coughs> defining the proximal form, removing the excess. So I'm also, what am I using here? I'm using an iliate separator to separate the teeth so that my blade can go inside and create a good emergence and remove all that excess. You can also use a wedge in this case. When you're, when you're finishing the proximal, always use a wedge because it separates the teeth and you can easily define your line angles. Okay, so that's initial polish. And that's your final polish. Okay. There's no excess proximally. Both the teeth look symmetrically nice. And I can see the, you can see the, how parietally also I have simulated the ridge on both sides. Okay. That's post hydration one week when I recall the patient again for polishing. This is before I start the poly This is after one week of hydration and polishing. And these were all pictures are taken with soft, with big um, studio lights with diffusers. And this one I've taken with my twin flashes without the diffusers. And you can highlight the line angles and everything looks very symmetrical. So that's what you can do uh, with different ways of doing stuff. Disatma or diastema, sorry for the spelling mistake there. So this is what I do. So sometimes, so for the diastemas, would you prefer layering or would you prefer a single body shade? So for diastemas now, I just use a single body shade because I already get a balance of opacity and translucency, which I require, okay? Uh, sometimes I will do layering as well, okay? Now it depends. In this case, I did layering, but this is a very, very old case that I did, but nowadays I don't, I don't let, uh, tend to layer. I'll just use one body shade to close my diastemas, okay? So again, this is an old diastema done by somebody else joined the teeth together. She had a small diastema. She went to three dentists before me to get a diastema closed. So diastema kept on increasing every time she went and she got repeated. And this is the work of a third dentist she went to, okay? And then she came back to me if we removed the, first of all, I, I, I split the, the old um, filling and then I placed my dam and then I very carefully removed all the excess composite which took me about almost 15 to 20 minutes because I didn't want to touch and remove the healthy structure along with it. Okay, so then I etched and bond. Again, I've used a mylar strip here using a finger technique to build the palatal shell. And then I've used a mylar to build the proximal hip. I build the proximal hip first because if I put my, my, my sectional matrices at this stage, if I put my sectional matrices at this stage, I'm gonna end up having it like this. And I'm gonna have this huge black triangle in between, okay? So in such cases, when you think you're gonna have black triangles, the, one of the best thing to do is build some composite here, build some composite here, so that your wedge now, now when you place your matrix is gonna be supported, it's gonna go out like that. 
and then it's going to go out like that. So now you don't won't have a black triangle here. So always build the hip first and then you do it. Okay, so that's what I did. How do I do this? I'm going to show it in the next case. Okay, then I placed my my last my proximal uh, proximal uh, matrices from uh, posterior teeth in a longitudinal manner, and I built the contact and the enamel shade. And then this is after finishing and polishing. Defining the line angles is the most important aspect. Remember that when you're doing anterior anterior dentistry. Defining the line angles is what defines the teeth. The, the outlook of, of, the, of the beauty of the teeth is defined by the line angles. And this is after in, in, with twin flashes, without diffusers. So from there to there. <clears throat> so be mindful, she was ecstatic, she was very happy. Again, I just had this recent biotermetrisis and I wanted to use Barclay matrices for this case. This is a case which is a case actually where I would have loved to do surgical crown lengthening and then give ceramic veneers. But this is a dentist, he's an endodontist. He is a PG student and didn't want veneers. He said, I don't want any, you know how dentists are, they don't want any surgery and they're done on themselves. Okay, he said, sir, just please close these spaces with, with composite and, I'm, and we'll think about veneers later. All right. So then I did some brain assisted smile. And this is all happening in my brain. This is how it's going to look. Okay. I did then did the mock-up on the computer. Then I drew these lines on the computer to see how it's going to look. The final form that I want. Okay. So ideally you should do a mock-up in such cases. Once you have a mock-up, then things become very easy. I didn't have time for mock-up because it was supposed to come from 250 kilometers away. So he just wants to, he wants to come here. He wants to, and he's, because he's a PG student, he doesn't get leave. So he wants to come to me, get the work done and go back the same day. So that's, that's what happens. No planning, nothing. So now this is again, a case of absolutely no non-invasive dentistry where we did not do anything. We did not touch the teeth with burr. We just sandblasted to remove the aprismatic top layer of enamel and to remove all the biofilm. This is how clean the surface was with sand blast with uh, sand blaster. Then I etched, and then now I'm using bioclear. So I'm using bioclear. I'm so I've used the bioclear in one, and I'm, I removed it to see whether I'm getting the midline is right or wrong. Okay, and I put the other, and then I removed it. Now, now remember, this is one of my first cases of bioclear. So I'm trying to see, I'm trying to analyze. That's how you learn. No, I'm trying to analyze. Where am I going wrong? What am I going wrong? So I can see that this part, that the other side looks a little more, more contour than the, than the end. So then I can do some corrections now and then do the, the building of the rest of the thing. So I did some corrections there, adjusted that and added more on, on one one. And then I did the laterals also like that. Okay, a lot of excess. And then I finished and polished it. It took me about two and a half hours to do this. What I want you to focus on is these lines. Look at these beautiful brown lines that the patient has effects here. And you can see these effects in the black and white picture. But you must remember the teeth are only till here. This is all composite. But you can easily see these lines going into the composites as well. How is that happening? How can you see all that what is beneath the teeth? How can you see all this happening in the composites as well? This is what happens when you polish and you control the thickness of the composites properly. It's so beautifully, look at that. It's like a shine. You can see all those lines going into, look, you see, it, all those lines are merging into the composite as if they, so they're actually beneath the composite but they, you can see because the light is reflecting is there's no refract there is no bending of the light the light is going absolutely straight through and through to the, to the structure because the refractive index is matching you can see and what what's underneath the tooth there that's why it's important to finish and polish so that's how it looked obvious case of crown lengthening but then he was very happy and ecstatic 
I told him this is just a temporary thing. You might want to come to me, and he said, "No, no, I'm very happy. I don't want to get anything done." And this is after a follow-up, six months follow-up. Look at the shine still holding nicely. Okay, another case. Small midline zestima are the toughest to close because you're just working the small teeny mini space that you have. So again, A3 body, A2 body, selecting the shades, air polishing. These are all non-invasive diastema closures without touching the, the tooth with the burr or with the discs. Okay, etch, always etch beyond as after etching, after bond application. Now this is how I will do a hip buildup. So I take a mylar strip, I place it on both sides on the palate and I hold it with my hands. When I hold it, I get this kind of a profile of a mylar strip. I'm gonna take my flowable composite and I just gently put it on, on one side. On both sides, it should go on towards the palatal also, it should go towards the label side also. And then I cure it. So I get a palatal hip like that. And then I build the other one like that similarly. And I get both. Now I'm going to place my bioclear matrices and place my wedge and hold the matrices together with the hand and do injection molding. Okay, that's what I get. I polish it. And this is after final polish. Of course, these azal embrasures are too narrow. I need to deepen them up a bit because the contact, the problem with diastomas is <clears throat> actually the contact is your incisors is actually 50% of the, of the tooth surface area. So your contact is actually till here. But because with diastomas, if I leave the contact here, I'm gonna end up having a black triangle here. So I don't want the black triangle, therefore the contact the, with the diastomas is usually broad. But what I can do is I can adjust this embrasure like this so that the, the profile, incisor and embrasure profile looks better. Okay, so that's what I did after I recalled the patient. So this is after polishing, single shade, no layering, nothing, all right? This is after polishing, this is the palatal side, this is monochrome, this is final, so obviously incisor and embrasure needs to be opened a bit. And then we recall the patient one week and I opened the embrasure more, I made it more deeper and now the contact looks better. The, there's no, there's a complete papillary fill. There is no black triangle, and there's just one body shade, which works amazingly, beautifully well. Provided you shape it and polish it properly, so that's what you want in the end. Okay. Let's look at black triangles. So black triangles are the, the best thing to do to do black triangles is with the help of your bioclematrisis. Now you will see black triangles if you have a lower incisor extractor because of orthodontic purposes. When you close the space, there's never a papillary fill that happens. So you have to tell the patient before you start the orthodontic treatment that I'm going to be removing this. Then I'm going to close the space. There is going to be a black triangle which we can close with the help of a tooth colored filling. Okay. Always when you're doing diastema closures, black triangles, you want a good having, to have a good emergence profile, you need to use rubber dam. Okay. So using a brinkers on the rubber dam, on the, on the uh, canines here. I air polish it, all clean. Now, before I place a wedge, I'm gonna place my bioclave matrices and I'm gonna build a, a hip. So I'm gonna etch, I'm gonna bond, and then I'm going to create a partial hip there. And I'm cured this, I'm gonna cure this part. Once it is cured, then I'm going to put a wedge. What, what if I put the wedge here at this stage? If I put a wedge here at this stage, it is gonna push the biochemical matrices apart and it's gonna push them closer to the tooth and I'm gonna end up having a black triangle again. All right, so I don't want to push the wedge now. I'm gonna do what is called as a delayed wedging. So I'm gonna etch and bond, I'm gonna create a cervical hip and then I'm going to place a wedge and now I'm going to fill the rest with injection molding. And then I am going to finish and polish this which takes lots and lots of time and effort. This is the lingual view. This is final polish. This is, I've taken the mobile patient just came for a follow-up for cleanup and I just took them to the mobile. The papilla has grown back up and that there's no black triangle at all. 
Okay. So this is what you can do with Barclay matrices. Okay. So I told you with veneers, I will prefer to do a single shade because with veneers, everything has to look uniform. If I put layering, if I alter, if I falter in the layering in either of the teeth, the shade is gonna go, there's gonna be a mismatch. So for veneers, I will use always use a body shade unless, unless the incisal edge is involved. If I want to change the length, if I want to change the, uh, the length of the teeth, and I, I want to add something towards the incisal ledge, then I'm going to do layering, especially in incisal edge area, because I want the incisal ledge to look beautiful with nice, beautiful effects. If not, if it's just that I want to change the color of the veneer and I don't want to change the form of the teeth, and I just do a window preparation, and I just then I'm going to just put a one body shade of composite, and that's it. Here, why I'm doing, doing this, because this is an old veneer done on a dental student after orthodontic treatment was done and look at the veneer. And of course, this has a ledge has to be restored. So do the shade selection similarly, button prior technique, I choose A2 chroma, always use rubber dam. See how, what happens when you, so you, can, you cannot see the overhanging margin here. The moment you place the rubber dam, it retracts the papilla and now you can see the overhanging composite margin there. And then I remove the margin. I remove very, very, this is the tough. I find this the most toughest part. So you have to do this dry. So you can keep checking whether the, whether the composite, where the composite is ending and where the tooth is beginning. So you have to, you have to be very, very patient when you're doing this. So old composite removed, prep finished and polished. Sandblasted, etched, always use. When you're etching, always protect the adjacent teeth with Teflon. And now I'm again, this guy came from Amritsar, which is six hours drive. Okay. So I'm using a finger supported Mylar technique to build the palatal shell. Of course, this is going, this is a, because this is going to, this is not a controlled buildup. So you will end up having a, a different kind of a, a, a length, which may be bigger or it may be more wider. So you have to correct it at this stage because remember the palatal key defines the mood of the restoration. So you have to set the incisal edge first and then you build up later. So I'm, I'm adjusting, I just, I've adjusted the incisal edge with the help of disc. Then I've done, so I've also drawn some mammalos making the adjacent teeth. Now I've used the opaque dentine shade to mask the, 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 the interface. And then I'm building a proximal wall with the posterior matrix. Now the scaffold is ready. I'm going to put my, I'm, I'm inside the ledge is a little opaque. So I've used A2 body on the label surface. And then the mammalons with A2 body opaque inside the ledge. Some effects, opalescent effects in between. Final enamel composite. And then I'm going to mimic the secondary grooves and the tertiary grooves that are there in the adjacent teeth on my restoration. Okay. Then I'm going to mimic the line angles that are there on the adjacent teeth with my restoration. Okay. And then I finish and polish. And that's your final from the incisal view. That's how it looks. So this is immediate. I could not see him after hydration because he went back to Amritsar and nobody comes for a follow-up. Just for follow-up, nobody also comes to me. Probably when he comes down to Chandigarh sometime, I've told him, come and show me once come for a follow-up and we'll see how this restoration is holding or is there any discoloration happening if you need to do any touch-ups. Okay, but that's how the patient left, was ecstatic. So like this, in this case, for instance, I, this is an old veneer, which is composite veneer, which is done by somebody else. I don't want to change the length. I don't want to alter the form. I'm just going to remove this. This is all done in 30 minutes. I remove the old work quickly. I put the rubber dam five minutes. I put a brinker because I wanted to um, expose my marginal, uh, my, my margin. And then I just took one body shade of composite, put it there, cured it and I just polished it. There were no textures to be done in this case because none of the teeth had textures. So this is how it was finally come up. This is all done in half an hour. 
easy money, quick money. Okay, one body shade just looks amazingly well if you polish it and shape it correctly. Remember, shape is shade. Okay, let's talk about finishing and polishing, and then we take a break. Now, remember, what's the time now? It's twelve o'clock. The first and the foremost thing when you have layered the composite is you get the form right, the outline form right, get the shape right. When I say outline form, it, I, what I mean is I want incisal edges. I want my corners, my line angles and embrasures to be defined first. Okay, this is what is called as proximal form. I want my labor contour to be defined in three planes. All right, especially if I'm doing a veneer, if I'm doing a class a class four inside the ledge, I want to have that contour and I'm going to do the finishing and polishing that manner. Okay, first, once the once the proximal form, the label shape, the label contour, the embrasures is all finalized, then I'm going to work on my vertical macro textures, which are like these developmental grooves. Vertical textures are nothing but two developmental grooves, which divide the label surface into three parts. Okay, so basically it defines the lobes. Your central incisor is made up of four lobes. You have one mammalon, oh sorry, you have one um, cingulum, and then you have three lobes on the label surface. And once the vertical macro textures are done, then in some case, in certain teeth, especially in the lower canines and the central incisors, you have these horizontal macro textures or horizontal grooves, three or four in number, especially in the cervical one third. Once that is done, sometimes you have small micro textures that you saw in one of the class four cases that is in, in, in the entire label surface or within the grooves. So you do, and you have this horizontal micro texture, which is the lines of red zest, which go through the entire label surface. And combining all this, you get the final form. How do you go about doing this? The incisal edge and embrasure correction is done with the discs. I, I prefer to use a medium disc, coarse disc and not the not the coarse one, unless there's a lot of composite to be removed, then I use coarse. And this is to be done at a slow speed. Once you get the form right, then correction of the line angles is to be done. Okay. Now this is done at an uh, This is done by marking the line angles on the sound tooth structure and then simulating it on the tooth that you are doing. And then you use this kind of red grid burr to move your burr at 45 degree angles across the line angle, outside the line angle to get the line angle in and defining it more. So if you look at the first picture and you look at the second picture, the last picture, the last picture looks narrower than the first picture because you have reduced the, the, lab, the label surface in which the reflection is going to happen. So you give a reflect, you give an illusion of a tooth which is being narrowed down. Okay, the dimensions are the same, but it looks narrower. This is what line angle can do to you. So you move it, you use it in a slow speed of 10,000 RPM. I use that, uh, this kind of a kit for my finishing and polishing, but you can also use any red grid diamond that is available 21F you can use uh, from money and you can do that. Once the line angles are corrected, then I am going to mark the label surface. I'm going to adjust the label contour in thirds. Okay, always adjust the label contour in thirds. And again, in a slow speed of 10,000 RPMs, always adjust in three contours, in three planes. That's how I am going to contour my labial surface. You can see a beautiful contour right from cervical to the incisal one. Third. Once your label contour is done, is set, and your incisal embrasures are set, your line angles are set, we need to define the inner surface now between the line angles. Remember the inner surface between the line angles is like a valley. It is not a convex surface. Your tooth is never convex like this. Your tooth is not a convex structure like this. It is never a convex structure like this. Sorry, if I draw the palatal outline, it should be something like this and not like this. There's no central bulge ever. The line angles are more defined like this and then here it's more defined like that. Okay, that's what you want in the end. Okay, so how do you go by doing that? How 
do you go about doing that? Okay, so you've got this. Now you will define the inner area in which you have to recontour the label surface. Okay, so this is going to be a ridge. Your line angle where you have you have two ridges on the your line angle defines the ridge, and then you have a valley in between. Okay, so like two mountain ridges and a valley in between. How do you define that valley? You define that valley by outlining this. So what I've done here is I have outlined this. Okay, sorry. I've outlined this part. I have outlined and marked this so that my blur does not cross this and flatten the line angle. I want to just work in this between the white line area. That's all. So I'm going to remove, use my blur in a to and from mesodistal direction and go from the incisal edge till the top. And I'm going to make this area slightly hollow or concave so that I get a valley there. Now look at the valley there. Can you see a two ridges? a valley, a depression, and then again, a ridge there. So there's a ridge, there's a valley, and there's a ridge. That's what I want from the labels, so from the incisal edge with a mirror when I see, I should be able to see this kind of depression in between the two line angles or two ridges at the proxima. <clears throat> Once this is done, then in between this, then I'm gonna mark the midline of the tooth and on the either side of the midline and in that area that we outlined, I'm going to mark the secondary macro textures okay like that what this is going to do is it is going to create two depressions on either side of the blue midline and elevate the middle lobe so i get the three lobe design and then i'm going to use this bar into and from motion going from the incisal edge till the middle third where i've marked on both sides and now I get these kind of depressions. You can easily see those depressions. See, you have a medial lobe, middle lobe, which is elevated, and then you have two depressions again on either side. Okay, once this is done, my secondary textures, everything is taken care of. Now I'm just going to smoothen the textures, smoothen all the burr marks. So the next sequence is, you will see that I'm not used burr or a disc on the label surface at all. I've just used disc on the proximal incisal edge and in the embrasure areas, that's all. And then I have to remove all those burr marks that I've created with the help of enhanced, poly these are enhanced finishers. These enhanced finishers are from Densply Serona. Okay, they are soft rubber cups and they smoothen the composite very nicely. Look at the middle lobe there. Look at two depressions, those are secondary textures and you have a single lump as the fourth lobe. That's how you want the label surface to look. Okay, so that's how you see. You can see the middle lobe very clearly. You can see the secondary mac, secondary grooves, the, the, the vertical secondary grooves very clearly. And you can see the ridges very clearly. You can see the central depression very clearly. Okay, and once that is done, before you finally polish, you will mark these lines of red tears if they are there. If the surface is smooth, then you will not do all these things. How do you do this? You do this with the help of a tip of any burr. You, you take a tip of a burr and you mark the lines, follow the lines like that. You have to do it very, very gently. Don't put a lot of pressure. Don't dig the composite, okay? Very feather tap, just a feather touch motion. That's all. And then I'm going to soften those marks with the help of pre-polisher from Eve, and then I'm going to finally polish it again with the help. This is after pre-polishing, and then after polishing, this is the final polisher. Again, 10,000 RPM. You can use this with water and without water as well. And then I use aluminum oxide polishing paste to give it a final luster. So this is done in two steps. One micron, which is fine, followed by 0 0.1 0 .1 micron, which is super fine. And you get a beautiful gloss like that. With all the effects that you've seen, you can easily clearly see those horizontal macro textures of Michael one third. You can see the secondary macro textures and micro textures. You can see the horizontal lines of red seas. You can see all those very clearly. Look at that. These are the line angles. You can see them very, very clearly. You can see the lobes very clearly. So that's what you want in the end. But you must ask yourself, is it predictable? Is it repeatable? Is it simple? And that's how you will form your own recipes of doing things. So, so it's not a single detail that defines excellence, okay? 
it's not one single single detail there's lots and lots of other things to be taken care of lots of small steps to be taken care of it's 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 the sum of many of them so it's, it's some of all the small steps that you do right from adjusting the thickness of the palatal shell right from adjusting the height of the palatal shell getting the proximal form right getting your memnons right getting everything in properly once you get that small different things in in right so it's like the recipe once you get the ingredients right the final result will be more predictable okay so it's not about perfect it's about effort and when you get that effort every day in your practice that's when transformation happens and i told you you have to work with your head you have to work with your heart you have to get passion into your work it's only when you get passion into your work you will achieve excellence which is a gradual result of always trying to do better always trying to tell yourself how can i make this better than yesterday always always be mindful of what you're doing okay you've had uh, we've had a great 3 days of of uh, lecturing on complete posterior vertebrae right from isolation to posterior composite and tear composites and and this can be summed up as to why what i why i do what i do can be summed up by a few lines uh, which are written by my daughter uh, she's my daughter she's nandini she's uh, 18 years she's going to be 19 now very soon and she wrote this i must share my light with those whose candles will not light not because they don't have matches but because they don't know how to ignite so you all have fire within you you all have the potential is just that you do not see that potential in you so my purpose is of doing all this thing that i do teaching is to see to unlock the potential that you have you know your wings are folded i want to help them you help you guys to spread them and fly all right so you can all do this if i as an orthodontist can do all this but then you can all easily do this okay i'm getting old now. you guys are still young you still have that potential you still that fire you still have that zeal to do it and if i have that fire and zeal you can also do it who's that chalu all right so thank you guys for your patient hearing if you want to connect with me with any queries you can follow me on my mail you can mail me you can follow me on my vishal central world page or you can follow my instagram handle which is zen underscore dentist okay so this we stop and we are going to everybody looks tired and zapped <laughs> yeah Yes, I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions. Uh, sir, I have a doubt. Yes, Manani. Uh, yes. So, sir, when we are not taking putty index and we are using our finger, blood finger, for the palatal reference, so when we reduce that extra incisal edge, so after finishing that, do we need to etch and bond the tooth again? Because no, I no, you don't need a... to. You don't need to. you need okay. to just remove that debris you just remove that debris just okay. remove the debris with either you can remove you can just remove the debris composite debris with a modeling liquid okay and sir uh, in few of my cases i have faced this problem that when i do in rubber dam after removing the rubber dam in case of midland diastema so like there is a small discontinuity between the tooth and the filling which i have done maybe because of improper rubber dam placement or so no. do i need to repeat the whole thing or can i correct you, it sorry what is the problem uh in cases of midland diastema there is a small lip like structure overhang which we can say between the tooth you and the remove. fillet yes that so, that will happen if you did not if your matrix did not seal and did not seal that interface do not okay. blend with the interface or you, you did not put the wedge you did not make a cervical lip or you did not place the wedge so that okay. a, the, the matrix was nicely approximated with the structure but if you have overhang which sometime you get you can remove the overhang with a 12 number blade very very blade. easily yes okay. or with the help of your ipr strips okay and sir another thing uh, uh, the crack which you stimulated in the typhoidant the vertical crack lines how to uh, stimulate that that is to be done in the stage before you layer the enamel layer okay 
and in case of fluoresces if patient is having that also after the body shade which we have placed. after the body shade yes before okay. the enamel shade is placed okay thank you sir hi dr vishal hi dr gayatri um i hope you're well i have about two questions with me please so the first one is uh, do you have an alternative to air polishing uh, well not really i mean if see the idea is to the only alternative to air polishing is that you take your profi paste and brush and clean that area mm. now how would you make sure that you remove the biofilm is you can just use the disclosing solution so before you profi you use the disclosing solution wash the disclosing solution is going to is going to is going to color all the plaque and the biofilm and then you take your profi brush and your paste and then you remove all the discolor all the colored area that you see till none is left so you are absolutely certain that you removed all the remnants of the biofilm right thank you so much and also um so the next question i have is some of the patients actually feel uncomfortable with the rubber dam on so do you sometimes give an infiltration or anything to give them more comfort or... gayatri all are dr gayatri all the cases are done under under anesthesia none of my cases are done without anesthesia okay. all okay. the cases you have to work with anesthesia in all the cases especially when you are uh dealing with longer appointments it allays the apprehensions and the anxiety of the patient one thing because the, the because the pain is gone because the pain goes away so the patient is as absolutely comfortable second thing is because you're pushing a wedge and you're pushing the matrices into the sulcus area and then you're using a 12 number blade to finish and polish which can inadvertently obviously sometimes touch the gingiva cause bleeding and cause pain you don't want the patient to feel all that Is, mm -hmm. Right, so you must work under anesthesia, even if you feel it's oh, it's a small filling, doesn't matter. Okay. And my last question is: um, there, there are sometimes patients who require um, phenol uh, when they they have a high phenol attachment. Yes. In those cases, do you still create the hip and then build up with the matrix, or do you prefer to? The, the, the hip, the lip has the the high frenum is the cause of diastema. Mm -hmm. So it has it has nothing to do with with any. The reason we create a hip is because we want to avoid the black triangle at the end of the at the end of the treatment, right? So in such cases, I always prefer like also in orthodontics when I close a diastema with orthodontics, we always close the diastema first, and then we do the phrenectomy later, right? So you do you close the diastema with your composite first, and then you do the phrenectomy later, because when you do the phrenectomy later, what happens is because of the scarring that happens after phrenectomy, the diastema holds; it doesn't open back again. Right. Thank you so much, Doctor Vishal. Pleasure is all mine. Sir, in continuation with the same question, sir, I have a doubt. So yes, Tejas. Uh, can we use this one, sir, instead of that? Uh, uh, what is that air uh, air polish, sir? Can we use? What is it? I I can hardly see this. This one. Yes, as long as it contains fifty microns aluminum oxide is coming out of it, you can use it. Okay. As long as you have a nozzle size which allows fifty microns of aluminum trihydrate or aluminum oxide to come through it with enough pressure of three to four bars. that's absolutely fine hello okay. sir hi pankaj uh, sir i have a question so what is the advantage of curing under the glycerin it is always required to cure under the glycerin so pankaj you did not attend our first year lecture no um uh, no sir so you attend our first year lecture and then you'll come to know <laughs> <laughs> just kidding i'm just yeah. kidding so i'm just kidding so you you have to use uh, glycerin because your top layer of your composite is in touch with ambient oxygen your oxygen is a inhibitor of polymerization so when you polymerize the top layer the top 40 microns to 60 microns does not get cured now this layer is reversibly inhibited 
which means that if you put some oxygen block barrier there and if you cure again it gets recured okay and if you don't remove that that layer then that debris gets collected and your finishing polishing will not be as great and as as what you want so you also, so you recure it under glycerin so you cure it and then you put glycerin and then you recure it for 40 seconds again under glycerin once you've recured it under glycerin then you have a hard composite to which you can polish and finish okay right sir and so one more question sir uh, yes. so in finishing polishing so we have to create the valley uh, between yeah. this uh, so uh, we should remove uh, or to create the valley in a three dimension or make a straight surface like three contour make we should have to follow the contour while uh, forming the valley of course the label contour has to be followed all the time, all the while okay as you go up you will change the direction of the burr hmm. i'm going to show you in when i when i show you the videos of the class for build up very detailed videos are made you will see how to do it right sir. thanks okay all right yes, so okay if you have any questions sir we talk about the labial surface but what about the palatal like the palatal ridges you all you talked about it but what about the cingulum and the palatal notch and uh, the palatal surface finishing and polishing you it's the same the process stays the same in there you just have to use a football shaped diamond to remove the excess at a slow speed of 10000 rpm and when you are removing that excess you have to remove it in a similar fashion as not to cross the ridges because you have already a valley there concave surface there mm -hmm. so you just have to stay within the two palatal ridges so you have palatal ridges two palatal ridges you have to stay within the palatal ridges don't cross that those ridges and just remove the excess then use your cups to remove the burr marks and then there you don't have to give any secondary grooves or anything no so you just have to have a smooth surface there that's it and then you would just use your your uh, enhanced cups and cones followed by eve diacom to spirals and you're done thank you also uh, sir i have put my question in chat box also so i want to know how to uh, what is the best way to manage uh, gingival polyp or uh, gingiva if you have to manage in uh, cervical caries cervical caries as in labial cervical caries the proximal cervical caries proximal caries proximal now you have to remove it babu you have to remove it you have to remove it with a blade you can remove it with a blade you can move with a cautery you can remove with a laser you can remove it with anything you can you remove with thermocut burrs or or anything so anything that can that you have in your armamentarium so if you don't have to have laser you don't have to have cautery you can use with blade the only problem with blade is you going to you have to wait to for the bleeding to stop that's yes, the only sir. thing the advantages of cautery and lasers is you don't get a lot of bleeding so you don't have to wait for hemostasis uh, advantage of again thermal cut burr is you have very controlled amount of bleeding and you don't and you just have to wait a little while for hemostasis to happen that's that's the only best way to do it so, sir, the best way is the is is the way that you are able are you are comfortable doing so there's no right or wrong way so sir, i'm also confused with the steps so first we have to uh, remove with the uh, suppose i'm using cautery so first i have to use cautery to remove the gingival polyp and then yes. i have to place and then the yes. uh, start with the our procedure of composite build up absolutely because if you do not remove the polyp how will you get the rubber dam to invert sometimes are not the polyps uh, suppose the caries extending to the root surface yeah so then you have to remove the then you have to remove the gums very very conservatively and in the interior aspect uh, there is also questioning of you know the gums will be removed and the exposure of the uh, the root yeah, surface yeah so that's so that's something that will happen that that will even happen if you do not um, see if it is a there was a caries and the and the tissue has grown over it you remove it the papilla will fill but if it is a labial aspect then you have to be very careful for example a class 5 subgingival defect if you have a class 5 subgingival defect then you have to be very careful in removing then you have to resort to what we call as surgical crown lengthening 
then you have to open it up. You have to make sure that you have three mm of space between the cementum and the uh, uh, between the CJ and the bone for the biological width to be maintained. Because that's something that's the label aspect. That's something that you see, right? So your your bone is not your papilla is not going to grow. Your label aspect of, of the gingiva is not going to grow back up if you cut it. So in such cases, always better to do open crown lending. You open the flap, remove the the caries, okay. remove the bone structure. Make sure you have adequate uh, uh, biological width, and then you suture everything back up. Do your restoration, and then you suture everything back up. That's how it goes. You understand? You have to open it sometimes. Open the flap, remove the decay, place your composite after achieving the hemostasis. Once the composite is done, then you cut the bone, get the three mm of, of of the distance that you want, and then you suture everything back up. But if you just cut the gums there and then do it, your gums are going to recede, and then it's going to look anesthetic. Mm -hmm. And also, you're going to lose a lot of attached gingiva. Correct. Sir. Thank okay. You, sir. Okay, so sir, let's take. <laughs> okay, so sir, one question, please. Yes, I know. Uh, sir, sir, if I have to modify, uh, add composite to an old or not a very old, I have to modify the shape or something. What's the yeah. protocol for adding to the old composite? So, if you want to modify to a while while doing the procedure, you did some correction and you modify. That's what you're saying. Suppose uh, it's a six teeth anterior. Um, uh, laminates yeah to change, change the color and the shape yeah and feel i have to uh, add more symmetry to both sides i have to keep adding a little more maybe after taking pictures i realize and then next and the next setting i need to do that so yeah so now the, there are two scenarios i'll discuss with you on this okay the first scenario is that you are let's say you're finishing and polishing combos and suddenly you see a void yeah yeah Okay, let's let's assume suddenly you're finishing and polishing or you see a demarcation line or you see a void. And now you see a void, I'm going to correct that void. How are you going to correct that void? If it's a very small void, then you just have to take a bonding agent. You clean that void. First of all, you clean that void, okay? Clean that void with a sharp probe. Remove all the debris that is there in the void. Take your uh, bonding agent, which is bottle three, which is fourth generation, bottle three or fourth generation or second bottle of sixth generation bonding agent, apply the bonding agent on that void and cure it and polish it. You'll see that the void will disappear. Okay. That's why like, that's like small voids that you have. What if you have a big void, what if we have a huge void that has come out, which is now obviously staring at your face, which looks very opaque. So then you take a round burr and you remove the void. Okay, expose the void and remove it. Once you remove the void, then you, air blast the surface with the sand blast the surface roughen that surface okay now remember the composite is still active at that point of time it is not still completely cured when you are yeah. working with a composite it takes about still 48 hours for the complete curing to happen and because it's partially cured maybe let's say 75 percent cured you have still have frozen free radicals and and free monomers still there which is active to bond to the newer composite. So in such cases, within two hours of polymerization, you what you can do all the corrections. So what you do is you sandblast, roughen the surface. After roughening the surface, you clean the surface with any, with, with alcohol, let's say. You take a alcohol, 95% ethanol, and you rub it, scrub it nicely for 30 seconds. You clean the surface of all the smear layer debris that has come because of the air polishing or because of the composite debris that has come because of your burr. Okay, so clean that surface with 95% ethanol. Once the surface is clean with ethanol, you dry the surface. Once you have dried the surface, then you apply, because the defect is within the composite, you don't need to etch, you don't need to you do anything. Then you take your bonding uh, agent, and because you're working on composite, you don't have to use a, uh, you don't have to use a, a single bond universal, just use a bottle three or second bottle of a sixth generation bonding agent, which is a pure hydrophobic resin, filled hydrophobic resin. Okay, just apply that, cure that, and apply your composite. So the steps are rough on the surface, clean the surface with 95% ethanol, dry it after drying, apply a filled hydrophobic resin, air dry it, and then you 
place your composite and cure it and finish and polish it again. Okay, okay. That's, what you, that's what you do. Now, if you have a composite, a patient who comes to you with a composite, which you did about a week back or 10 days back, or maybe a, a month back or two months, six months back, he comes to you and there is a chip and you're not happy and you want to repair that. In such case, now the problem is the composite is completely cured and it's inert. Okay, so there is no way if you follow the same protocol, there is going to be any cohesive bonding there because mm -hmm. there's no, there are no free frozen radicals or monomers which will chemically bond to the uncured composite. So it's also in such cases when you roughen the surface, when you roughen the surface and you wash and, and clean with ethanol, you have to have an additional, do an additional step. And that additional step is application of silane. Why do you buy, apply silane is because silane will convert this hydrophilic surface that is left after sandblasting and convert the hydrophilic filler particles into hydrophobic filler particles. And you want that surface to be hydrophobic because composite is hydrophobic, bonding agent is hydrophobic. So, okay, so then the next, so for a delayed bonding, you just have to add the step, step of silane after you clean the surface with ethanol. So you clean the surface with ethanol, you dry it, then you apply a layer of silane, then you dry that, then apply a hydrophobic resin, thin it, and then cure it and apply your composite. Okay. Okay. Fine. You got that done? Got it, got it, sir. And uh, so one more, just one more thing, uh, for the translucent translucency effect, we need to use a translucent composite. Yes, I'm going to show you all those translucent effect shades in a moment. Okay, sir. Okay, thank I'm you. I'm going sir. to show all the materials that I use. I'm going to show you what I use for translucency, what I prefer, and what are the things, so that you can then you have a clear idea of what I use. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Most welcome, Dr. Anand. All right, guys, let's take a, it's 12.32, we'll, we'll take a, of course, I wish you ladies could have had something, but I'm, 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 I know most of you are fasting. So just, so 15 minutes, we'll take, we won't take a lot of your time. So 15 minutes break and we get back again at around 12.45. And I'm gonna go and play some videos which I've made specially for you guys. I did this last week just for you guys, because they realized if I play videos, I can pause, I can discuss step-by-step -step build up of class four, how to put everything, how to do it right from the start, right from fabrication of putty index to finishing and polishing, okay? So connect again in 1245, all right? So you can, don't leave the meeting, but you can switch off your videos and switch off your mics and I'll catch you in a while.
Hi guys. So I'm going to be <coughs> showing you how to You can keep your mics on while this video is playing because then we can discuss at, at the same time if it's pertaining to anything that you want to talk about, okay? So I'm gonna share my screen. We'll just keep it on when this someone is... has to talk something. Otherwise it'll be like yes, a lot of people. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. So you can just, if you want to, if, you're, if you have a doubt, just switch on your mics and ask me there and then, okay? So I'm gonna, you can all see this, right? Yep. Okay. So I'm may, making a party index now. So let's say we are assuming that <clears throat> tooth number one one already has a mock-up done and we're gonna make a party index to record the mock-up, okay? Shells. So you see, I'm now, when I'm working on central incisal, I'll make a putty index from K9 to K9, okay? And then I tap on the parietal spec. A lot of people I've seen don't leave enough volume and thickness of the putty index at the incisal edge. They will have lots of volume at the back, but at the incisal edge, they will make it very thin, which does not serve any papers. So keep it adequately thick in the incisal edge. And as I told you, do not allow it to cross the labial extent of the incisal edge. Okay, see the putty index from the top and you should not be able to see the, the labial surface of the incisal edge, which means that you should not cover the, incisal, the labial surface as well. Because if you cover it, as I told you, then your incisal, the parietal shell that you make is gonna to be too thick. Okay, so that's one. And then I will also make a, second putty index so i'm also going to make a second putty index which is going to be a complete putty index, okay? So it's going to cover the labial and the parietal surface as well. Okay. You can keep it on the inside as a ledge and roll it on either side, or you can place it on, the inside, on one surface and then roll the other. Always better to keep it on the inside as a ledge and roll it on the either side so you don't have a void there. And then I'm going to just press it, tap it gently from both sides. Now, as I told you, why I need this another putty index is because I want to control the thickness of the layers. And I don't rely now mostly, there was a time when I would use anterior Mizura, but I realized that it was very cumbersome to use and it's not as accurate. But with this putty index, I can very accurately know what is the thickness of layering that I've done? What is the thickness of, of layering that I require? And before I polymerize it, I can adjust the thickness and then cure it completely. So it becomes it becomes really predictable with this kind of putty index. Okay. Okay. Let's check the indices now. Let's check these indices now. You can see the incisal edge. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the putt index from the center of the incisor, from the inside center of the label surface and the parallel through and through. Please mute yourselves. Please mute yourselves. So what am I doing here? I'm checking, you see? That's how you cut it. So this will accurately tell, tell you how much you're layering and what is the thickness of layer that you want. Okay, so once the indices are made, you keep them aside. And now we are going to make a palatal shell. All right. So I'm using a palpic NE. Now this NE is a enamel shade, which is a highly translucent enamel, okay? This is a highly translucent enamel from Tokoyama Asteria. Now you can also use enamel, any enamel, chromatic enamel shade also. This is a achromatic enamel shade. When I say achromatic, it does not have A2, A3. It's just plain, clear, translucent. It does not have any shade. It does not have any chroma, okay? absolutely translucent. So this is an any shape. Now you get lots of other shades like this, for example, white enamel, NE, opalescent, clear translucent. I'm gonna show you those shades in a while, okay? Let's just finish this demo and then I'm gonna show you all the armamentarium. Okay, so this NE is an opalescent shade and that's what we are going to be using to build the palatal shell. The step is, is you have marked the palatal shell, you have marked with the probe, how much extent you want. Or maybe I just skip the video, just a minute, please. I think I skipped one video, marking the, yeah. I wanna show you this because all these things, small things make a lot of difference. So what I've done now is I've, I've taken a tooth with a class four defect and I'm checking the index, okay? The mammalons are recorded nicely, everything looks good. And then I'm gonna mark the index. Don't create a ditch, like a deep mark. You just want some idea where how, how much you have to layer, how much the extent is. Also don't use pencil to mark, please. Because if you use pencil to mark, the pencil marks are gonna get incorporated into the composite and then you have had it. Okay. All this loose debris of PVS material, polyvinyl oxygen that you see there, of your putty that you see there, you just need to clean that up nicely. Okay. Use your modeling liquid or bonding agent ever so slightly and just smoothen that area, clean that area so that there's no marks there. Okay, then you're going to etch. Protect the adjacent teeth by etching. And then you etch, always etch beyond the bevel. 
I have not created that bevel. If I was there, I would, I would smoothen this bevel a bit more. Okay. Now these are the teeth. They are, they come like this. They are typotron teeth, which already cut for class four practice. So otherwise, I would extend this bevel a little more, and I will fully finish and polish this bevel. Okay, of course, I think it's going to get edge the plastic tooth, which is just for didactics. And then we wash it, clean it, and we dry it. And we dry it with air. And I'm going to put my Teflon against because I want to apply bonding agent. When I apply bonding agent, I always keep the Teflon in place because I don't want the bonding and you get stuck to the adjacent teeth and then there is a problem. Your, metri your matrix is not gonna go there. Apply a bonding agent, single bond universal, rub it, scrub it nicely for 20 seconds, cure it from for 20 seconds from labial and 20 seconds from palatal. Hair dry the bonding agent. And then bonding in interior is not very problematic. So cure it 20 seconds from buckle and 20 seconds from labia. Okay, now we are going to see the parental shell. All right, here we go. So we had marked the line and now I'm placing a I'm placing NE as I showed you. Look at how uh, I'm not I'm not pressing the composite. I'm just moving the composite in the direction that I want it to move with a very, very balanced amount of pressure. Don't press on the composite and keep do this. Adapt the composite gently. Okay, this is an instrument which is called as modular. And I love this instrument for this purpose. Making sure it goes to the incisal edge, making sure there's not a lot of thickness, making sure it does not cross the incisal edge, making sure it does not cross the proximal outline of the tooth. And then I'm using this, this beautiful instrument. Look at how, how nicely it smoothens the composite or plus skull pad. This is Opla skull pad from Avkla. Always extend the composite slightly beyond the mark so that you don't get any voids. Now it's important to remove the excess because the composite may be too thick. If the composite is too thick, it's important to remove the excess and always remove the excess from the labial surface. I'm making sure I stay within the limits and confines of the teeth. And then I smoothen it, always smoothing it towards the incisal edge, the brush. And this brush is coated with modeling liquid. Let's go slightly fast forward this. And then I'm going to take it. And place it there. Once I place it, I check with the mirror that there is no voids anywhere. It's chucking and it's sufficient there. I always take a brush and try to adapt it to the tooth surface.
you have to be very gentle. When you ask a system to cure it, once the curing is done, do not remove the putty index yet because sometimes you can have voids in these areas in the interface. So don't remove the putty index yet. So what you do in such cases is take a clear transparent liquid, for example, clear color from Tokoyama, or you can also take a bulk fill flow. Bulk fill flows are usually more translucent than the regular flows because they are made translucent for the same purpose because you want the light to transmit. So you take a bulk fill flow and place a small drop of that on that interface, okay? So take a bulk fill flow, put a small drop there. And then this is a bulk fill flow, set to 50 XT. We'll take and take a sharp row. For example, I'm here, I'm using Fishura from, from Stanley Italiano, uh, from sorry, LMR. And I'm just very slightly, it has to be very little. Don't fill the entire bulk with that. It's just so that they, if there are any voids, they get filled up in that area, okay? And then you cure it. Now very gently, take your time and remove the putty index. And see how thin that is. You can see the edges and the proximal is opaque. Even though I did not put any opaque here, it's a pure translucent materials. How come this is opaque? And this, this is what is called a selective transmission of light. It automatically gives you that opaque, inside the ledge, an opaque halo that you want. That's the beauty of these materials, these opalescent materials. And look at the, prog the palatal form. It looks absolutely nice. The, the very loose composite, you just take a sharp blade, like a 12 number or 15 number, and with a scalpel, just remove that. The finishing starts right during the stage of layering, okay? Remember that. And I'm checking the fit of this. So you can see the amount of layering that needs to be done, the thickness, the volume. You can easily make all that out. See how beautifully the 12 number blade works. This is all bonding agent that sometimes gets tapped in that space and then it doesn't allow the matrix to go through. Okay. So once the parallel shell is done, we're gonna build the proximal wall. There we go. So you can use any matrix that you want. Uh, so I, so okay, I, this is a spoon shape matrix that is very good for interiors. And I'm placing this. And then I'm going to check the profile and the contact. And don't forget to stabilize the matrix. Here, here the matrix was so nicely stabilized between this, I forgot to place a wedge there. So, but you have to place a wedge because that creates separation for the tight contact, one thing. Secondly, also it stabilizes the matrix while you're building the proximal wall. So don't forget to place the matrix, uh, so the, sorry, the wedge and stabilize the matrix. So I've used a spoon-shaped Torvia matrix here. 
gives me a beautiful profile uh, and I'm comparing the profile with the rest of the teeth. Contact, look at the beautiful profile that I get there. Once I've done that, again, I'm going to take, I'm building an A3 enamel, choosing an A3 enamel here. A3E, see it's right, it says A3E, which stands for A3 enamel. And I'm going to take a small increment of it. And place it there like that. Rest it at the bottom so that excess keeps rising up. You remember, you want this to be thin. Okay, take your applica, which is a fine blade like instrument, and you cut the excess. When you cut the excess, you have to cut it in a wedge shaped fashion. What do I mean by wedge shaped fashion? fashion. Wet shift means that it has to be like a triangle. It has to be like a triangle. It should be like this. Like this, like that, like that. Which means also it should follow the contour. The contour of the, of the incisors is like this. So from here to here, it has to go like that, which means it has to go Go, sorry. It has to go like this. So it has it has to have a tip here and the base here. Okay, so make sure it goes and gets pointed down there. Otherwise, if it's too thick, your incisor edge is going to be too thick. It has to follow this contour. I'm merging it with the rest of the tooth now, making sure I get a point and making sure it follows the outline, the label outline of a tooth. If I think it's too thick, I press it more, it gets more thinned down. All the extra that comes up, I again trim it. So always when you, this is the method to trim, to thin your composite. So press it at the bottom, the excess goes up, and then you trim the excess in the shape that you want. The biggest mistake that I did here, I did not put a wedge. Because when you're doing all this, your matrix should be completely stabilized and should not move. Do I take as much time on a patient? Yes. Okay. I am very, very particular before I go on to the next step that every step should be as meticulous as possible. If you think you will do this in the end, the finishing can be taken care of in the end, then you forget about it. Then it, you will never get the result that you want. This is the triangle I'm talking about. The base, the tip, and you can easily see that triangle now. Nicely finished. Adequate thickness of 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 millimeters, smoothing it with a brush. The height of this should be close to the height of your label contour. That's how high it should be. Okay. Check the palatal, it should not come out from the palatal aspect. Abhi Pankaj sochta hai, itta kaun karega?
<laughs> Once you are satisfied, which I'm clearly not right at this stage, but once you're satisfied, you cure it, okay? So, I know it's annoying. I'm, I'm very, very finicky, okay? So please bear with my annoyance. And then I am going to cure this. That's how it looks. When you cure it, press the, the joint like this so that there's no excess there. Because most common problem that you'll face in UMA excess is at the proximal. It's very difficult to finish the proximal. That's the most difficult area for anything to go there. So make sure you have least excess there so that you don't take a lot of time to finish that. Then I'm going to very carefully remove that. Look at that. Look at the thickness of that. It's thin, it's less than, it's almost 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 millimeter in thickness. And that's how it should be. Once you've made this, always check with the putty index that you did not go beyond the boundary. So your putty index should is is a is a is your checkpoint it's also all, all these are checkpoints once you make a proximal wall see it is following the outline of the proximal wall see the putty index it these are all your checkpoints if it is not it is it is broader some people will make it too wide then and then you have to trim it and make sure before you go into the next step you make sure that you trim that and get it to the ideal ideal outline and then you proceed further okay then don't wait for it to be kept, to be done in the end so, sir, if I may ask, in such cases, and you just mentioned, suppose you've gone wider, I'm on preacher. So, so you just mentioned that suppose by mistake you've gone a little wider. What is your, uh, you know, instrument of choice to trim it down back? So, is it usually the I, disc? I will use a disc. disc I will use a disc or a bar, depending on what 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 can go there. The ten thousand RPM with the electronic, yes. electric kind of handpiece that you use. Yes, and, and without water. water. Without water, yes, of course. Always without water. Yes, sure. sure. Okay. okay, so once that is done, now I'm going to, proximal wall is done, I'm going to build my inner dentine core. Did I share the screen? No, I did not. So this is the dentine core. So that's, that's done, now I'm gonna build the dentine core. So what I'm using here is, a2 dentine. And look how I'm placing it. It has to be placed in a wedge fashion, wedge shape, which means it should thin down as it goes through the inside the ledge, and it should be thick at the interface. But this is the inner dental core. Of course, the mammalons and all, I will build them with my body shade. I don't like to use uh, dentine shade for building mammalons because it becomes, it looks too opaque. Always leave Dentine is, you have to leave proximal areas clear of any dentine because you want some sort of opalescence and you blend the top layer with the bevel. Cover it partially with the bevel so as to hide the demarcation line. Blend it nicely with the rest of the tooth structure with a brush, making sure that it does not go until the incisal edge there. And then I'll check, before I cure, I check, do I have enough space for my body and for my, for my enamel shade? Yes, that's enough shade, enough space there. That's the best way to evaluate space, isn't it? You can easily clear how much space is left. And then on the other side as well.
Now, in small restoration like this, you can even just put one dentin mask and one enamel shade and finish it off. Okay. But always at the junction, try to put a more opaque mask, even ever so slightly, so that you can hide the demarcation line very well. So smoothing it up, marking where the mamelons are. It should confirm to these mamelons that are there, these grooves here. That's how it looks, then you cure it. Once you cure it, I've taken a body shade now with which I'm going to define the thickness of the mamelons and the design of the mamelons and it will cover the dentine shade completely and also the bevel, almost, almost the entire bevel. Okay, just leaving a little space there. Then I'm going to define the space. So always leave this proximal space. It's very important for you to leave this proximal space here and proximal space there. Okay. And before I cure it, I'm going to see whether I have enough space for the enamel. This is almost 0.5 to 0.7 millimeter of space. And if there's any excess, I can actually equally distribute the space. See. I can equally distribute the space so that I have a uniform enamel layer. And that's the advantage of using this kind of putty index. Just trying to get the angle right so you guys can see. You can see that thickness of the mamelon is more here. So I'm going to press it slightly. So I have uniform space. Okay, once I'm satisfied, I'm going to remove it. And then I'm going to finally shape my mamelons. So this is a three mamelon design, which is very typical and very, very common. There are five, four, five kinds of opalescence. So you have honeycomb pattern, you have three mamelon design, you have four mamelon design, in which the middle mamelon is split into two. And then you have opalescence only in the proximal areas and not in the incisal edge, which is usually you see in the, in the, in the worn teeth. The incisal edge is completely worn. <clears throat> and you can see the design of the opalescence. The design of the opalescence is controlled by the design of the mamelon. So you can see the incisal halo, the clear area here, like this. This clear area is what defines the. You can visualize how the opalescence is going to look at this stage. They look good. Okay, and now look at that. The mamelons they thin down. 
So the thickness is not is not completely evident. They thin down as they go towards inside the ledge. They go down like a wedge. You can see this small, there's still space for enamel there. Don't make mammalons like Wolverine claws, huh? Like Wolverine claws. Don't make a mammalons like, like an M also. Don't make it like an M. Make it thin, make it, make it nice and give some artistic touch to it. Always leaving little space for opalescent masses here, which I'm gonna fill. Once I'm done, I'm going to cure this. And now we are going to place the opalescent masses. Okay, so opalescent masses are different kinds. You get clear translucent. This is a trans opal from <laughs> Impress. This is a clear color from Tokuyama. All these are opalescent masses. They will give you the clear color. They, were, they are absolutely clear. They're absolutely translucent, transparent kind of colors. So what I do sometimes that, that incisal halo, that opalescence is bluish in color. To give the bluish effect, you can mix the blue color with the opalescent color. So very, very little amount of blue color. This is a blue gray color that is there. And you can mix this. You can mix this. This is a tetric color, blue, bluish gray. Mix this with the polyacetylene mass. Very hint, very little hint of blue, not a lot of blue. It shouldn't be obvious that you can see the bluish thing from a distance. And then somebody asks you, what is the bluish thing? So don't make that obvious, okay? Very subtle. And just applied in between the spaces between the teeth, okay? Which you've left, starting from the proximal. Why I like to use this flowable for opalescent areas is because they go into all the irregularities and nooks and corners, and there are less chances of any voids. If I use a packable opalescent material, for example, clear, translucent, or trans opal comes also in packable form, Clear translucent from Z350 XT also comes in packable form. If I try to, these materials are very tacky. If I use them in packable form, there are chances. You have to really press them into the spaces. Otherwise, you end up having voids. Okay, you can see that subtle bluish gray effect in the incisal edge. You can make sure there are no voids. Tease it nicely. You can see the bluish effect. You can see the bluish grayish effect. It has to be ever so subtle. Don't make it very obvious. And then you cure it. You can see in the reduced exposure, you can see the bluish effect there. Okay. Now, the last thing that we need to do is place a outer enamel.
Okay. So we cure that. And then I'm going to take my A3 enamel, with which we build the possible for uh, a wall. And now we are going to This is a beautiful instrument to place this. Do it slowly, do it gently. Don't try to. So normally at this stage, what you'll do is you will create a bulge in the center because that's how the hands move. You will press more in the proximal and keep a lot of bulge in the center. So don't do that. Consciously try to avoid that. Okay. So I'm going to show you how you do a mylar pull if you want to or, or protect the adjacent teeth from the composite and get the contour. It's very easy to get a contour with a mylar, you get a beautiful contour. It's difficult to do it on the model because it's unstable, but just to get you some ideas, see, you automatically get this bulge here in the proximal areas. Can you see my mouse moving here, guys? On the truth? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So in this bulge, you can, also see, you can see how I got that bulge like the bulge I have here, okay? Sometimes you have to do this twice and thrice also. Move the excess and then quickly again. Always check from the incisal view. That will give you the perfect view that your label surface should match the label surface of the adjacent teeth. Because when you see incisal view, you are able to see the label surface of the, of the sound tooth. And then you have to make sure that you match the thickness with that thickness. And also with the putty index, you have that you can easily see that I'm slightly deficient somewhere. I can easily push the composite more in that area. And then on the other side, I always try to add a little more to compensate for the finishing and polishing. Okay. I'm also checking thickness of the inside. So let's see. Use your indices. And they'll help you guide you so that the, in the end your finishing polishing does not take so much of time. So, yeah. Uh, so, if I have to add uh, stains and uh, um, white that, spots, that should have been added before I layered the enamel. Once I did the dentine buildup, the with, with body shade mamelons and all were build up. Yeah. After that, I'm going to put the chromatic spot wherever I want to, then okay. cure that and then put the enamel layer. Okay, sir. So, I finish with a brush, always checking from the incisal view, whether I got it right or wrong. See, almost the same, look at that. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Dr. Manpreet. So which body shade did you use? I use the A2 body. Okay, thank you. Look at the outline form, it's almost finalized.
Checking with the index. And I cure it on both sides. And then finally, put a glycerin and cure the thing completely. Look at this. Look at the form here. Almost finalized, isn't it? Slightly more excess, which I intentionally put so that I have room for finishing and polishing. This is the palatal view, and that's your buckle view. Okay. There is the rubber dam interference. Uh... Uh, for putty, placement of putty index? No, you modify the putty index. No, you okay. cut it. You cut it. The, you get the excess putty index right from middle of the canine to the middle of canine so that there's no interference of the rubber dam of the interference of the clamps of the rubber dam with the putty index. Cut the excess palatal surface of the putty index. Okay. Then let's get to finishing and polishing. The steps. The first step in finishing and polishing is to adjust the incisal edge. How do we do it? So you make a putty index, mark a putty index, and you mark the incisal edge. Okay, you'll come to know where it is more thick, where it's out, and you then get it in. Also mark the, pellet, the, 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 the incisal edge of the adjacent teeth with the side of the pencil, not the tip of the pencil. And you see, this is where I want. I am I'm slightly out on the diesel aspect. But look at, look at my layering. It is already in that buckle contour. It's already following the buckle contour. So then I'm going to use my discs. And then, and also when I'm checking, adjusting the incisal edge, I don't want to cross the incisal one third of the area when I'm adjusting the incisal edge with the discs. So I mark that area, making sure I work only in between the incisal one third and not above. There's slow speed, the speed that you can control. I'm just gonna remove wherever the excess is. Always checking. Once you do this, always check. Again, checking, see? So which micron motor was used, sir? Which what? Which micro motor was used? Is it a controlled uh, speed? Like what? Yes, it's what a control exactly? speed. I, I use electric motor okay. from WNH. Okay, that has got a contra-angle. Uh, yes, that, that, is, that is a contra I can fit my contra-angle to it, and I can okay. control the speed. So this is right now working at a speed of 5,000 RPM. Okay. See, I'm checking the contour. It looks absolutely similar to what we have. And then I take my pencil and mark from the side of the pencil. Always use the side of it. It will automatically mark the incisal edge. Now you see both the incisal edges are almost in one plane. So once my incisal edge is set, then I'll define the light angles. Remember the outline form, incisal edge, the proximal embrasures, light angle and buckle contour. That's, that's how, that's the sequence. Always mark the light angles with the side of the pencil. Use the side of the lead. It will automatically mark the irregularities. Can you see the irregularity on the distant surface here? You can see the irregularity here. You can see some irregularity here. And also mark the of the of the sound to structure the line angles that give you idea of where you want to place the line angle. They have to be symmetrically placed. You can see the irregularity on the distal surface here, so that will automatically mark the irregularities. And then I divide the surface into three planes.
Okay. So I'm going to now correct the line angles to so speed. Proximal embrasures. The key to adjusting the embrasures is to correct the palatal aspect of the embrasure, not the label aspect of the embrasure. Remember, always when you are adjusting the embrasures, Work on the palatal aspect of the composite, not the labial aspect or the proximal aspect of the composite. If you work on the palatal aspect of the composite, it will automatically take care of the embrasures. Okay, so then we do the line angles. And that's the angle. Now, this is important. Pay attention. How do you work? How do you remove your bird with the line angles? So when you move, so here the line angles are obviously at the top. If, if they are bored inside, then I'll use a wedge to separate the teeth and then work on the line angle. So the, my, my bird does not touch the adjacent tooth structure. So that's a kind of a sharp 21 F bird that I'm going to be using in the slow speed. This is at the speed of around 10,000 RPM. And that's how you work on the outside of the line angle to smoothen it. You see, it is going, this line angle is going more towards inside. So I have to get this in, slightly in, in this direction. Don't use a lot of pressure. Let the bird, bird work. Otherwise, you're going to create ditches. You want it to be smooth. Okay. I come to know where the rough is. I smoothen that up. Then I mark them again. So this is now adjusting the labial contour. Once my line angles are more or less done, I'm going to adjust the labial contour and I'm not going to go beyond the line angle. Now, remember the label contour has to be done three planes. So when I'm doing the middle, I don't touch the incisal one third. See? And then I join them together. The label contour is done. Then I mark the line angles again. Okay, once this is done, then I mark the thirds. Now the, I've created the ridges. Now I'm gonna create the valley. So I'm gonna mark that area. This area is marked so that I do not cross this area. If I don't, if I make this, this like a valley, this automatically part automatically becomes elevated. If this gets depressed, this automatically looks up. So I'm not going to cross this blue line. That's why I marked it. 
It has to be very little in microns. That's it. You can see the valley, you can see the depression in between now. Starting to focus. Yeah. You have this elevation at the sides, depression in the center. Then you're going to mark the midline and you make the secondary macro textures, those Eiffel Tower kind of grooves, secondary grooves. And you take your burr. Do not cross the midline and you just work in a mesodistal direction. Very little depression. It doesn't have to be like a ditch. It's a, it's a shallow depression. That's it. Bus. Basically, you mark it and make adjacent teeth and get the same marks there. And then you remove all the burr marks with the help of your enhanced cup and cone. So basically it helps you evaluate what have you achieved so far. Okay, so just gonna clean this with water and see what we've achieved so far. You can see the vertical grooves. So there is a void here. For such a small void, if I have to correct this, I'll basically just remove this more debris in the void and put a bonding layer and that's it. Now I'm going to be using a disc to smoothen that area. But this is a fine disc. This is not medium. This is, this is not going to remove a lot of composite, but smoothen the area. And you have to be very careful when you're using it because it just, it can, if you're using it at high speed, it can just go into the content and break the contact. So you have to be very, very careful when you're using it. The idea is just to smoothen the, the composite in the proximal area, smoothen the line angles. And even if you use them with, with increased amount of pressure, you can change and remove a little bit of composite. Otherwise, it just acts as finishing disk. So you got a smooth line angle there now. A little bit of adjustment required here. You can you are beginning to see things as a translucency now slightly in the one third. See, everything is smoother. Now I'm going to draw my tertiary microanatomy. I'm going to take the tip of a burr. I'm just going to, just going to follow the outline. It's like a wave. And you see the marks are, I'm holding the burr very lightly, just touching it slightly. That's it. Moving it like a wave. Okay, now you remove all the burn marks. And I'm creating those mamelons here, inside the ledge, the tip of a burr.
These are secondary microanatomy textures. Very small little textures, micro textures. Then every time you use a burr, you need to soften the texture and remove the burr marks with enhance. Remember that rule. You use burr for correction, you soften it with softlex. You use again burr for correction, again soften it with softlex. Uh, sorry, with enhance. So now I'm going to, I get to do my pre-polishing with water and, in, and I put water because it removes the debris alongside and doesn't allow the disc to heat. And you'll be able to see all the effects that we have created so far. See the secondary textures are seen. Now, after this, before you polish, if you want your lines of redness to be more accentuated, then after pre-polishing, before polishing, make the lines of red CS. Because if you make lines of red CS and then you use a pre-polisher, it's going to remove all the effects that you've given. So at this stage, you want to give tertiary effects, you can give at this stage. So I'm going to draw my lines of red CS and then I use my burr. Similarly, then I do not use my pink Eve diacomp. I directly use my final polisher. If I use Eve diacomp, it is going to again remove these effects. Okay. So just soften it very lightly with enhance and then use your final polisher, which is your Eve diacomp polisher, which is your gray one. And you'll be able to see all the effects starting to, it's going to start shining. You can see the opalescence. You can see the light reflection on the line angles on the label surface. I'm going to show you a close up picture. This is, this is not a high resolution a video camera which we are recording this. I'm going to show you a pictures that I've taken in with a DSLR camera. And then you use your aluminum oxide polishing paste, one micron followed by 0 0.1 micron. And people who've attended my posterior weblet, they will see that the steps of polishing stay the same. They do not differ whether it's anterior composites or posterior composites, it does not matter. And then uh, you are going to, sorry. So this is extra fine that we're going to be using now. And again, with water, some amount of water, you need to use some amount of water with these. Working. Okay, never mind. It's sort of there's a glitch in the video. I'm just going to show you the final pictures. So that's the last step. And then you will see. Then I've taken the pictures with the show my presentation. And you see the pictures now. See, you can see all those effects. 
this is a very quick thing i had to otherwise i would have made i would have made the lines of edges more closer together just to give you some idea about how it is done so look at the incisal view the both look symmetrical to each other this is a transmitted light you can see the bluish effect you can see the opaque incisal edge so yes those are the steps which i follow regularly every day without fail and eventually you get the kind of work that you want okay uh, but if you really want to understand this you have to do it yourself if you do it yourself on a model you will understand much more better and when you work on a model it's much i tell you with my own experience it's, it's easier to work in a patient's mouth than it is to work in a model because a model you're working in a plastic tooth the shade does not match there's no there's a, you can see the obvious irregularities and all that stuff with with with, with your patient's teeth it, things are matching it's confirmed the head is stable it's much more controlled in a patient's mouth than it's a model but if you can achieve this in a model you can easily achieve this in a patient's mouth without any problem okay so if you have any questions regarding finishing and polishing or any other aspect we can so, uh, talk about it so yes please uh, for the polishing buff which you use in uh, the end is there an alternative yeah. Oh, it's a part of a. It is. It's a part of the enhanced kit, no? No, it's I part have of the. So, do you get to buy that separately or? Uh, uh, no, that's... it's a. Uh, Doctor Anil, it's a part of the kit. And when you buy that kit, you get the no. you get the sponges along no, with it. I have the kit, sir, but then uh, it's huh. getting uh, over. It's getting finished. So you, how you do I them, do? You ask them for the spares, no? Okay. They can give you the spares, or you can use any cotton buff. You can okay. use any cotton buff to uh, to spread the paste. You don't need to have those sponges specifically, or you can use uh, Lucida Star polishers along with this paste. Okay. The one that are powered by Style Italiano. You can get okay. those if you find them expensive. Then you can use any normal cotton buff. Okay, sir. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Uh, hello, sir. Sir, what is that uh, red bar? What is its number? I think it's twenty-one F or twelve F. I'll confirm and get back to you. Okay, sir. I, I think it's mostly twenty-one F. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, we are using that uh, enhance uh, uh, set. So, sir, we are using it on uh, which hand piece, sir? Enhance is always all the finishing polishing has to be done on a latch hand piece. It has to be done on a slow speed hand piece. Contrary, uh, contrary, micro motor. Okay, thank you. Yes, sure. The the palatal shell that you had made, you had used a different composite, uh, yeah. not the same shade as your uh, this. Is it? Uh, do we? Uh, do I mean? Do we? You can we use the enamel shade itself, or it's better Absolutely. to use? You can use the enamel shade, but sometimes when I'm looking at to get more translucency. And opalescent, more opalescent effect. Then I will use a NE or a clear enamel, or I'll use a white enamel. Now I'll tell you the difference. The difference is when I use a white enamel as a translucent, as a layer, as a palatal shell. Now I'm going to show you some of the things that. Uh, so when I use a white enamel, I get a different kind of opalescence. When I use a clear enamel, I use a different. I I get a different kind of. When I use a trans opal, I get a different kind of opalescence. Okay, so I'm going to show you some opalescent shades, and you will then understand what I'm talking about. Okay. All right. So let's see. Give me a moment.
Okay. So you have this. This is white enamel. Okay, this is a very opalescent material. Very, very clear, transparent. See, it's very transparent. Okay, this is white enamel. This is when I want the incisal edge to have a little more white look. I want to have a white incisal halo, then I will use this. And this is NE, which is neutral enamel, which is not going to, this is going to be uh, like a neutral opalescence that it gives me. Okay, like the one that I used, it's going to give me the amber color incisal edge, not complete white, but an amber color incisal edge. Okay, this is again from Tokoyama. Then you have opalescent masses, which are like this. This is trans opal. This is trans opal. This is flowable trans opal. You can use this for the opalescent effects, the flowable thing that I used and mixed with a gray blue color. Okay. You also can get beautiful opalescence with its clear color from Tokoyama. This is called as clear acetylite color, clear acetylite color from Tokoyama. Okay. You can mix it with the bluish grayish color and you get the same effect. All right. Then I use sometimes opaques like opaque. This is an opaque to hide the translucency, to hide the darker discoloration of the teeth when you're doing composites and you want to build up. This is a very beautiful opaque color. This is not a white opaque. This is actually a, this is actually a yellowish opaque. Can you see it's a yellowish opaque. This is not white opaque. This is like a yellowish opaque that people used to mark that the, that the um, technician used like an opaque for the PFM crowns. It has the same kind of color, masks the color very, very nicely. Okay, what else? What else? Okay, what else do you want to see? You also get clear and amber translucent CT and AT shades. CT in 350 XT. Z 350 yeah. XT, yeah. yes. You get the CT and the AT shade from Z 350 XT. Just give me a moment, I'll show you also. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So these are your CT and AT shades. So this is amber translucent. AT. So it gives that amberish look in the incisal one third or also in the incisal. Third. Instead of blue or gray opalescence, you get an amber counter opalescence. And then you have this CT clear translucent from again Z350 XT. Okay. So these are all opalescent shades that you get. Also, you get something called as trans 30, trans 20. Now, this trans 20, trans 30 are basically. Trans 20, trans 30 again are opalescent shades, but they don't have so much of opalescence as clear as trans opal. So trans 30 has less opalescence than trans 30. Then trans 20 has little more less opal, uh, more opalescence, sorry, than trans opal. Trans 30 has little less opalescence than trans 20. So that's how in the decreasing level of opalescence, if you don't want a lot of opalescence, like for instance, I just want to build the incisal edge, then I use trans 30. It gives me that beautiful opaque incisal edge automatically because of the way it selectively, um, you know, reflects the light. This is selective transmission of light. So you have to really experiment with these and to see what can affect what shade is getting. For example, excuse me, sir, I, your voice is unclear. Now, now it has settled. Yeah, that's because of the fan. I was feeling hot. So I, so I, so I switched to the fan. 
So anyways, I'm going to show you this. Look at this opalescence here that I created here. Okay, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah. Can you see this? Can you see this amber color inside the ledge on the lateral inside the? This is because of NE. It gives you that amber look. I did not. Now, the difference between the first image and the second image is in the first image in the central incisor, on the incisor edge, I've used the dentine shade to give me that opaque look to have a halo. Whereas in this lateral incisor, I have not used any opaque composite on the incisor edge, but it still looks opaque. This is the beauty of using opalescent masses. Uh, how is that opaque? That's a topic of a different discussion altogether. Okay. So, but then that's this is what I'm experimenting with now. Instead of using opaque shade on the incisal ledge to mimic the incisal halo, can we use opalescent masses and then trim them or selectively sort of give a bevel on the parallel aspect to 60 to 70 degree to mimic the 60 to 70 degree incisal ledge direction of enamel rods that we have in the natural enamel? to have that same opal opalescent effect. In natural enamel, there is no dentine on the incisal edge, but it still looks opaque. Why? So I'm trying to mimic the same thing with the composites now. So sometimes I'm getting successful, sometimes I'm not. So I'm trying to formulate now a recipe as to how do you get opal opaque effect without using any opaque material on the incisal edge. It's about beveling. It is about adjusting the, giving the right kind of bevel so that there's internal reflection that happens in a similar fashion in the composite that happens in the natural enamel. You get it? So, so I'm still working. I'm still on that stage. I'm still, I still keep working and still trying to uh, get there. But then I, just to show you, just to show you how, how does it work? How hard work that is there? So all the slides that you see, uh, you know, it looks as if it's, but I, st I still keep practicing. Huh? I still keep, I still keep practicing. I still keep <clears throat> trying to experiment new stuff, new materials, trying to understand the optical properties, especially when it comes to um, all these beautiful effects that you have to give. Look at the amount of pictures that I take just to understand stuff. Huh? I'll show you, I'll share the screen and I'll share the screen of my photo library. Huh? And you'll see how, can you see my photo library? Look at the amount of pictures that I've taken to get to, to just make 10 or 10 slides. Look at the pictures, look at the amount of pictures that I've taken to get those 10 slides, sir. You see, this is what I was talking about. Can you see the opaque incisal edge? This is all composite. That's opaque incisal edge, and I have not put any any shade, any, any, anything there. It's just the natural opalescence of the material that I've used that gives that opaque incisal edge look. Okay. See, I keep working. So many pictures to be taken to get the right direction, right edge. Anyways, these are just materials and stuff. So, so many stuff, so many materials. See, just to make, to understand if you put the index, what is how the put the index should be made? I've made so taken so many pictures. Uh, these are the pictures of the work that I did, all that stuff. So it, 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 it requires, you need to do bench practice. If you don't do bench practice, then you will never understand the materials. You have to practice assiduity, remember? I hope you all remember what assiduity is. Can I replace enter, uh, enter missing tooth with composite? Why do you want to do that? Huh? I can't hear you. Patient uh, like to replace it in one day in an emergency situation. In an emergency situation, you can. You can use a rebound and then you can do it. How can you do it? Uh, how can replace it? 
missing tip so that you can do with a ribbon no place a ribbon which is a composite fiber splint place a ribbon and then you build the the tooth on top of it can't understand then i'll have to look for a case which is we don't have time i'll share the case with you on whatsapp remind me okay i'll share the picture with we'll take some time to find that case i put that case some time back but it's going to take a while for me for you to um for me to find it now so i'll just share it with you later okay sir i didn't attend your procedure composite uh, web leg so can you please tell me a uh, brief me about the uh, final that aluminum oxide polishing tell you about what so the final polishing the polishing paste you use so the polishing paste that i use is aluminum oxide polishing paste it comes in enhanced kit it has two grits 1 micron and 0.1 micron so 1 micron is a, is like a fine and 0.1 micron is super fine ishita so use fine first with the sponge and then use super fine 0.1 micron and you'll get a nice gloss okay uh, hello sir so, yes ma'am good uh, uh, how to mask the fluorosis stains on the teeth suppose if we have the dark brown stain and i wish to do the composite veneering then what is the procedure the procedure would be that you have to understand first of all i'll do the bleaching i'll get the stains to be a lighter color once the bleaching mm -hmm. is done then i'm going to remove the more of the tooth structure it depend and it depends on how much is the stains so then i'm going to remove let's say almost a millimeter of the enamel and not just do a conservative prep of 0.7 mm or 0.5 mm i'm going to use at least 1 to 1.2 mm of enamel i'll remove 0.2 mm i use as an opaquer which is going to be this uh, opaquer from impress direct and then i'm going to do my layering once i've stopped that and that is how i'm going to layer so i you need to keep space to hide the discoloration you can't be conservative in such manners so, okay so having said good. that you, having said that you still have to do corrections so once you do it then you see where you gone wrong and then you correct it so opaque means so that uh, yellow is opaque or white one yellow is opaque is better the discoloration is yeah. huge a yellow shopaker is better because it mimics the warmth of the of the dentine and the body shades that you are going to be using hmm. right okay so i think if you are all okay we are done hi chule how are you I didn't hear from you your throat is bad i hope you had understood everything yes uh, thank you for that uh, i had a question before about layering uh, Uh, yes. Is it okay to mix different composites from different companies, or would you avoid that? Absolutely okay. Absolutely okay. Okay. You see, most most of these composites will have the same kind of formulation. They'll have bis GMA, they'll have a TG DMA. They all will have the same kind of monomer components. So there is no problem in mixing and matching your bonding agents with different composites or different bands of composite one on top of each other. There is no problem. I do it every day. It does not cause any problems. Good. <laughs> Thank you. So you don't that. have to think. You don't. So this this is just a marketing gimmick, which is done by the companies. Oh, you know what? You have mm -hmm. to. If you buy our bonding agent, you have to buy our composite. That's absolute bullshit. You can use any composite with any bonding agent. That's not a problem at all. Exactly. It's very confusing because they're all saying that uh, you can't mix them together. So. Uh, no, no, you, you can use any kind so the only thing you need to worry about is if you cannot mix you can cannot use a dual core composite with a single bond bonding agent you have for dual core composite you need to have different bonding agents because you need to have an activator to activate the tertiary amine which is present in the dual core you know dual those dual core composites which can which you can cure by light and they do self cure also Yes, you know those 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 composites. You cannot use a regular bonding agent with the dual core composites. You need to have an activator along with it. 
you understand so don't mix don't use dual core composites with your regular bonding agents mm-hmm. for dual so core composites have, like so for your uh, yes activate <laughs> You yeah. need to have, it, for example, if you use paracore, you know paracore from uh, uh, coltine. Yeah. So paracore has its has a non has a non rinse conditioner, and then it has two bottles, and these two bottles, one of them is an activator, which is required to activate the tertiary amine, which is present in the which is a self cure component of the dual core uh, composite, because you need something to activate the benzoyl peroxide. So this tertiary amine reacts and and uh, with a benzoyl peroxide, creating the free radicals, initiating the chemical part of the dual pure composite polymerization. So you need an activator along with it. You can't use your regular bonding agent, a uh, single bottle system or whatever for the dual core bonding agents for for dual core composites like paracore or fluorocore or luxacore. They have their own bonding agents which have an activator along with it. Certain companies will provide an activator which can be used with a regular bonding agent. And then you mix them and then you can use that. But then you need to have an activator. That is the only thing you need to need to be careful about. That's all. Otherwise, you can use any bonding agent with any regular light cure composites. There is no problem. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right, today. Can you share some books and journals to refer for for composite articles? You need to read the articles. There is no, there are no books. So this book called as, uh, there's a book called as uh, Albers, which is a very very old book, which is a real really good book to get your basics right. Uh, for bondings, you need to understand and read the journals. You can read journals from Von Von Mirbeek, and all those, um, uh, you know. Uh, Yeah, of all those uh, Japanese people, Fujiyama, and all those people, uh, you know, you can read those articles from there. Uh, for other clinical stuff, you can use, you can read Layers by Jodi Manuta. It's a wonderful, wonderful book that is going to give you a lot of insight. Uh, then for composites, for uh, Layers by who? By Jodi Manuta. So it. It's a it's a book which is written by husband and wife Anna Salat and Jodi Manuta are husband and wife, so they are the part of the Style Italiano group. Their husband and wife have written this book called as um, um, Layers, which is a really 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 good book. It'll make you a lot of concepts clear. So that book will tell you what how to do, how to get what are different kind of appellations, what are different kind of intensives, what are different kind of characterizations, how you can mimic this with the composite. It's a wonderful book to read and to follow. uh rest is also follow you should follow the works of wonderful wonderful people you know so there are a lot of people that that have influenced my work for example uh denis kutikov uh then you have uh, viktor shabakov uh then you have tony rotondo from australia amazing guy uh then you have um uh, philip uh philip were i don't know worder were something i think from uh, brazil uh, and then you have philip brizara from brazil so a lot of people i follow a lot of people whose work really influences my work um, yes i've i've learned a lot from their cases <clears throat> so yeah yes that's the book darling that's the book thank you sir players so one more one more question atishita So, sir, I have uh, one recent case. Actually, I was waiting for your webinar to uh, know about this case. So, uh, this patient is forty-nine years old, and he has deep bite, and he got implant in his uh, mandibular interiors also. So, there is a cap in mandibular interiors, and still there is deep bite that is not corrected. Now he came to me, and there is uh, in the upper. Maxillary anteriors, the palatally, uh, there's loss of anatomy. There's loss of rear facets are there. There's a spacing yeah. between uh, lateral and canine. Okay. Okay, and uh, also there is brownish uh, uh, coloration, which I can see on the labial of maxillary only, which I feel uh, maybe the the dentine, the sclerotic dentine from the palatally, it is giving that. Uh, okay. so uh, my question is uh, can we do composites in this case number 1 because the deep bite is still there so palatally i doubt uh, if we do if you we have, have space palatally 
to give a composite there? So right now space is there because there's a lot of uh, VFS that have happened. But if I build up, then no, 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 the, I... no, no, no. This this one aspect is there's a wear facet, and yes, then sir. the wear facet facet is because the lower teeth are coming and creating the wear facet. They land into the wear facet. Correct. Is the lower teeth landing into the wear facet? So the deep bite is still there, and I guess they will be in contact. If, so... Ishita, there will be in such cases. You plan in plan it on the models. You take a model, you place the model in occlusion. Then you see from the from the lingual aspect, from the parietal aspect, from the behind the model, you see whether there's a there's a space or not. If there is no space, how can you build it up? So the first first and foremost thing is to do some orthodontics to open the bite, and then you you build all the loss to structure. What is the other way to do this? Other way to do this is with the help of what is called we are we call it this Dahl principle. So in a Dahl concept, what you do is you build the lost part of the enamel to the regular thickness as to what you think was there. You build it like that. When you build it like that, obviously when the patient closes, the patient is is not going. The back teeth are not going to meet. There is going to be a posterior open bite. Then you allow the patient to be like that for a couple of months. Tell the patient that it is it is that is what we achieve, want to achieve because what is going to happen is then is when the patient bites, there's a posterior open bite. There is going to be super eruption of the teeth at the back. The, it is going to act as the anterior bite plate. Okay. Okay. This is called as a Dahl concept. D A H L. So you, you allow the posteriors to super erupt. Once the posteriors have got contact. Now the anterior contacts are relieved. Then you, once you, once you've got that, then you finalize your anterior restorations. So now the patient has got the bite which is opened now. Now you have space. Now you can restore it with the palatal veneers. You can do direct composite palatal veneers, or you can do ceramic palatal veneers. You understand? Yes, that is what I would do. That is what I would do. I'll do. A, this is a perfect case for dahal. Concept by doing it with dahl concept, but then you have to tell the patient that he's going to feel uncomfortable for a couple of months because the back teeth are not going to meet, and it'll be difficult for him to chew. Okay. Sir, a small question one. Yes, Pankaj. Uh, sir, uh, while layering, we use a brush to make the smooth surface. That I think silicone. Yes. Brush. Uh, so this is this is not a silicone brush that I'm using. I'm using a normal uh, normal brush, normal brush. Normal painting brush. It's not a paint brush. It's it bristles. It's a normal bristle brush, but it's, it's a brush from Tokuyama or from GST. Okay, so that brush should be used dry or should be incorporated. With always something? with modeling liquid, Baba. I mentioned no. Always with modeling liquid. Liquid. Dry, so it is not going to work only because when you put it dry, the composite is going to be pulled away completely. You want the composite to merge, not pull away. So if the mm. composite sticks to the brush, it is no good. So when you okay. use it, make sure it does not stick to the brush. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so Yashita here. Yes, Yashita. I wanted to know, sir, uh, what are your uh, comments about the use of loops? For anterior composites, or absolutely always. Now, when you use loops, there are two things you need to understand. Hmm. You need to use loops of less magnification when you're doing anteriors. When you're building anteriors, fine. When you when you're finishing and polishing, always use less magnification because you want to see your field of the more the magnification, the field of view reduces. You're not able to see. Uh, you're not able to see clearly, and hmm. because you lose the depth of field. So sometimes you will lose the orientation also. So beach beach may you should always remove your loops and check whether the proportions are right or wrong because then you can't. Sometimes with loops you can't you can't measure the proportions correctly. Yes, sir. yes. Sir. And so one more question I had uh, in case of uh, toothbrush trauma which causes cervical abrasion in some cases. So for restoration, how do we go about uh, the restoration of such cases? Class five case. You are talking about class five ditches. So you use composites. Use a bevel on the enamel. Use a give a long bevel on the enamel. Okay. Once you give a long bevel on the enamel, because you are here, the retention is mostly going to be from enamel and not from dentin, yeah. because that's a sclerotic dentin which is, does not have a very good bonding capacity. Yeah. As it is, you can bond to enamel more predictably than dentin. So use 
six generation sc bond universe and in such cases this is a beautiful bonding agent for such tried and tested on class 5 lesions and also you give a very long bevel on the link on the labial aspect on the enamel and get let the composite have an infinite bevel and that is how the composite is going to stay oops thank you so much you're welcome all right guy okay maheshwari sorry <laughs> thank you sir uh, sir i just have a question uh, shall i use the uh, microfill instead of enamel layer or shall i use the enamel layer and then put the microfill because uh, microfill is a microfill sir. is a composite it's a composite it is not enamel or body or dentine yeah it's for highly polishable that how i yes learned. so you can use microfills as the top layer no problem at all okay sir and then no i should no problem uh, at all Yeah, there are but, two ways whether you want to use achromatic microfill or you want to use a chromatic microfill okay sir so achromatic microfill is like a clear translucent shade or trans opal or trans 20 or trans 30 but when you want to use those shades you have to be very careful that you make sure that your result does not look very opaque now you know where i would use achromatic is only in sizeal 1/3 where i want the mamelons to show okay sir so sometimes i'll use achromatic composite only in the sizeal 1/3 as the final layer and the, the rest of the thing i will just use my regular chromatic enamel why because i want the incisal effects to be more enhanced so i'll use white enamel only at incisal 1/3 and the rest i will use my regular, regular chromatic enamel now this could be microfilled also or this could be nano i prefer to use nano filled i don't use microfilled yes, sir and uh, one more question sir just one more question sir uh, there are also soft flex uh, still there are two more light colors uh, the yellow and light yellow uh, in actually now i'm using that and finishing with the enamelize paste but uh, i don't know now after i seeing your video i was little bit now confused in which situation i have to use the light yellow disc and uh, the other one from soft flex you're talking 3M. about the soft flex spirals or soft flex discs Softflex 3M. Now you showed in the video that we are using the red disc, sir. That after that also there are two colors, yellow and light yellows. Find this. So yellow and light yellow. Yellow one, the orange one, we basically is the one which is medium, uh -huh. and the light yellow is the one or is the one which is fine. Now, where do you want to use this? Is where you want depends on how much composite you want to remove, Maheshwari. If it, there's a lot of gross excess that you have to remove, I will use a brown one, which is the coarse one. Okay sir. And then I'm going to use if I if I feel I just want to recontour something and I don't want a lot of coarseness there I want to be controlled then I'll use a yellow one. Light okay. yellow one I only use when I want to polish the area uh, where it's not going to remove a lot of my composite but it's going to smoothen the composite more. That's where I'll use. And the fine one which is a super fine which is absolutely yellowish the color which is super fine there are four discs that come in softflex. Yes sir. So I call it brown I call it the brown mm -hmm. I call it the light brown uh, and then I call it orange and I call it yellow. Okay sir. So the the yellow one is a super fine which will yeah. not going to remove any composite but yeah, only give you gloss. Yes. Yeah, so, just for yeah. polishing. So I never use discs uh, for finishing and polishing. I'm I'm sure you must have seen that top. Yeah, I only sir. use I yeah. use enhanced cups and cones and then I use Eve Diacom uh, Diacom spirals and I'm sorted. Okay sir. Okay sir. So three and steps uh, and you get a glass like polish. Why do you okay. want to do so many steps? Okay sir. And uh, I just need your uh, uh, settings uh, for the anterior uh, composite, the photo, sir. I'm having the 100 mm lens and using the Canon. 20, but, 22 uh, to 25 f-stop, which is your aperture shutter speed, uh, 160 to 200. ISO 100 and sometimes 120. Sometimes I want to bump it up a little. So yes, f-stop, you have to place between 22 to 25. Shutter speed between 160 and 200. Okay, sir. Thank you. ISO 100. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, one, sir, one last question, sir. Sir, uh, seeing your videos, there are multiple mattressing systems. What you have used in for different different cases, you have used different different mattressing system. So, is there any small uh, nutshell kind of company which you have? Uh, which you no, there is no nutshell kind of a company. There's one company called as Tor VM. that will give you a spoon wala matrix and the regular matrices or vm matrices i think if you get if you have those they should work in 90% of your cases nor vm sir 
TORVM, TOR, it's a Russian company, TORVM. Okay, guys, can I say okay, guys, now? <laughs> okay, before we have any questions, if you have any other questions, you can connect with me on, on WhatsApp. We still, the group is still active. I hope India wins today. We have a good match coming up at seven o'clock, a cricket match, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, with, and of course, um, we all of you have a wonderful, wonderful Karvachot. God bless you and your husbands. And take care of yourselves. And if you have any problems, any doubt, please feel free to get in touch with me. And if you really want the real way to learn composites, it's always doing a hands-on. Okay, I'm not promoting my hands-on course, but I know I told you it's an art where I can hold your hand and teach you what, what is going wrong. So if you really want to come and join and do a intensive hands-on course, feel free to come and join me on 12th, 13th and 14th of November in Chandigarh. Uh, we all booked for Mumbai courses all is all, all finished. And uh, the rest two courses which are going to happen are in Kochi and Coimbatore in December. Okay, so if you want to come, we still have four slots left for our Chandigarh course. So come over, it's a three day course and it's gonna be worth a while for all of you guys. Okay, so Akshay, you're awfully quiet today. <laughs> I can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. Unmute. Today, rest of the dentists at the clinic are all out. Now, all alone. <laughs> so I'm just watching. <laughs> I hope you didn't sleep. Huh? I hope no, 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 no. I, I, I <laughs> was about to at a point in time, but then I just woke up and, you know, did some stuff. Great. Uh, it's good to have I think you. about the teaching, it's just me and sleep. Okay. We have a very. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hello, guys. We'll uh, I'll take your leave and uh, God bless you. Love you all. Take care of yourselves and be in yeah. touch. Yeah. Sir, can we so thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye, Tuli. Sorry, who's that? That is Shita. Yes, Shita, what are you saying? So, can we WhatsApp you the case photographs and discuss uh, about the case? Yes, the, the group is going to be, be going to stay alive for a year. Uh, but when you WhatsApp the pictures, we're going, to, we're going to set you the rules, give you the rules. I just formulated new rules a couple of days back. So uh, when you, because you'll take picture from uh, from any angle and expect me to give you a view on that, I cannot. Uh, if you give take a shabby picture from from all the angles and then I can't see anything, I cannot. You can't expect me to 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 help you in a very uh, fruitful manner. So please send me clear pictures taken nicely and. Um, also, uh, what do you think is, is your problem? Clear cut. Don't tell me, sir, can you, don't tell me, send me one picture and tell me, sir, treatment plan for this case. I cannot do this for you. I'm not a treatment planner. Please, I want you to think. Send me nice pictures. If you have a problem regarding that particular aspect as to how to go about it, I'll be more than happy to help. The group is going to stay active for a year. So I'm available to, to help you around for one year round starting from today onwards. Okay, so if there's anything, not a problem. After that also, if you want to reach out to me personally, that's not a problem. I'm a very, very uh, affable person. So that's not a problem. Though my looks, my mustaches may suggest otherwise, but I, you can, I am a very, very affable person. You'll, I will usually reply in a day or two, but if I don't, just keep sending me reminders and then I'll keep saying, okay, or call me. And tell me, okay, sir, please, it's an emergency case. The case is tomorrow. Please have a look at it. Because then I'll have a look at it. All right. So take care, guys. God bless. Have a good day. Enjoy your Sunday. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, so Thank, so Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir.